lots of good mornings on the chat. Let us know who's who's there. Um, where are you joining us from? There's a question as to whether the recording will be available on YouTube. Perhaps we need to reply to that. Uh, we can certainly put it on the, the Facebook, uh, so the YouTube account of Fit Europe, yes. Okay, we've got 150 people online now. Shall we get started? And you've shared the, um, the live stream, John. Yes, it, it's, it's gone live. Okay, all right. So good morning, everyone. John already introduced, introduced himself, um, one of the leaders of, of this um, session, Fit Europe. This is, of course, for those of you who've just joined us, the um, Translating Europe workshop towards common European GDPR guidelines for the translating and interpreting profession. So with Fit Europe and partners across Europe experts um, in GDPR and the language services industry. Um, if you want to tweet about the event, um, we've got two hashtags, translating Europe and TEWGDPR, which is our event hashtag. And this is also being live streamed on Fit Europe's Facebook page. And as John already mentioned, um, it will be recorded as well. So if you've signed up, um, you may also be watching this later on as a, as a recording. Most of today's sessions will be in a webinar format. So attendees are muted and your microphones are off. And the people who you see on the screen now are our project team, our experts, um, and our hosts. We will finish the formal part of the program at 3 p.m. CET, so all times are, are CET. Um, and we will then finish this webinar and move over to Zoom meeting for our last session of the day, which is the breakout rooms between 3 and 4 p.m. So we'll give you a link to the breakout rooms at the end of the end of the day. And that is open discussion for you to come and join us and, and talk about your concerns, experiences, ask questions from the experts and so on. But otherwise, during the day, we are um, in this webinar. We've got a few breaks um, during the day. Leave the webinar running and come back to it at the allotted time. So you can see today's schedule there um, in front of you mm -hmm. on the screen. There is somebody um, looking at the chat and Q&A pane. So use the chat if you've got any questions. At the end of each session, we should have a little bit of time for your questions. We've got one larger panel discussion and that will end with a quarter of an hour for Q&A. So we'll take your questions on various topics discussed at the panel session um, then. So without further ado, I think we're going to welcome Christoph Nalepa from the European Commission, who's been instrumental in enabling this Translating Europe GDPR workshop. Over to you, Christoph. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Raisa, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we are having this meeting in very worrying times. When we were setting the date for this uh, conference, we had no idea that it will take place after the world as we know it um, would change completely. As, uh, as all of you, I have uh, thousands of thoughts about what's going on, but, but one of these thoughts is that we should continue our normal business and and uh, and pursue our plans as much as we can that's why i'm uh, 
I'm really, really happy to be able to open this conference on behalf of myself and uh, Director General uh, for translation of the European Com uh, Commission, or strictly saying the Warsaw Field Office of, of uh, DGT. Well, I'm opening this, this conference on behalf of the European Commission, so it might suggest, and uh, you may have the impression that I am uh, the, the main guy be, behind this project, which actually is not true. Uh, we are certainly proud to, to contribute to this, to this great initiative, but most of the credit should go to others in this, in this case. And, uh, let me mention FIT Europe, Freeling Foundation, EU Association of uh, Translation Companies, Polish Society of Sworn and Specialized Translation, TEPIS, uh, University of Dublin, Ireland, University of Lublin, Poland, um, Irish Translators and Interpreters Association, um, uh, Translation Industry Employers Association, Polish Association of Translation Companies, uh, Polot. There are quite a few partners who have contributed to this project, partners and individuals, and a special mention uh, must be made of, of, of one person who's uh, not with us, as, as John said at the beginning, Stephanie Bogertz, who, um, who approached me about this project a few years ago, in the pre-pandemic -pre days, which seems like ages ago now, and uh, she has pushed it through ever, ever since. When the project was finally approved, um, Stephanie has worked as the main, or one of the main coordinators of, of, uh, of this uh, workshop. So I think this, this conference and the whole project is kind of a child of hers, and it is it is uh, very sad that uh, that she can't be present when this child is like being born. But but she's absent for a reason, as as John mentioned. Uh, Stephanie lives in uh, Lublin uh, region, which, as you may know, is close to the Polish-Ukrainian border, and she's doing a tremendous work in 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 supporting a huge inflow of Ukrainian ref refugees, which is taking place now. She's helping also with, uh, with translation and interpretation because, because uh, believe me, uh, translators and interpreters are doing tremendous work these days and they are in great demand, which I think is, is, is another example and, uh, and evidence of how important this profession is. The, the essence of translation and interpretation is to connect people. And in, in days like these, this connection between, between people is, is simply, simply crucial. So great thanks to, to, to Stephanie. And also, if you're listening now, Stephanie um, has asked us uh, asked us to, to, to transfer this message to you. Any kind of support help is, is very much needed at the border. Okay, back to, back, back to the conference. Uh, as I said, European Commission is not the main actor in this particular project, uh, simply because GDPR, surprisingly or not, is not a big issue for DGT translators. We have our internal rules and we follow them, but they are, mm, I could say, pretty basic. Nothing compared to the complexity and uh, the multi-level variety of, uh, of GDPR application that is relevant for translators and interpreters outside DGT in the translation and in interpretation market. Uh, this is a huge issue for translators because translators are very much exposed to data, to data handling, and they play various roles in this data processing um, mechanism. Uh, 
And the interpretation of GDPR varies across uh, Europe. There are many disparities, there are many uncertainties and even concerns uh, regarding the application of GDPR. And that is why I think this project is so crucial. And that is why the European Commission has decided to support it uh, financially and to include it into the Translating Europe workshop uh, project. Uh, just because it is the ambition of the European Commission to promote translation to contribute to the development of translation and to consolidate the, the various actors of the translation um, stage. And that's really what this project is about. So once again, let me, let me say that I'm very proud that we are part of this initiative. I'm very proud that uh, Warsaw Field Office uh, is representing the European uh, Commission here. This project is very complex and long. The conference uh, we are holding now is just a stage of it. It's, uh, it's towards the end of the project, but it's not even final. It, it has been preceded by a number of surveys and, and um, working meetings, and it is going to be followed by the development of, of uh, guidelines to be used by translators and interpreters across Europe. So this project is first of, first of all, is going to be very useful. I think that's what makes it very special and kind of exceptional to the, the, the practical part uh, of it. Having said that, and, uh, and without taking more of your time, thank you very much for viewing. We are very happy that the interest is so uh, huge. I wish you a nice conference, a good day, a constructive and inspiring discussion. Thank you very much again and, and over to you, Raisa. Well, over to me, actually. Over <laughs> to you, John, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your kind words and also all your practical support in the, in the last period with this project. And now it is my great honor and pleasure to present uh, Mr. Wojciech uh, Biorowski, who is the European uh, Data Protection Supervisor. The European Data Protection Supervisor and its office is an independent uh, data protection authority within the EU. Uh, it ensures that European Union institutions respect the right to privacy when processing data and also when developing policies. And the, this uh, European Union body has been particularly active in recent years in issuing a whole series of reports and policy papers about various aspects of privacy, data protection, and so on and so forth. And we are very pleased to have today here the European Data Protection Supervisor who will uh, make a sort of short keynote speech for our event. Uh, Mr. Vivoreski has a degree in law and also a PhD in law. Uh, he worked uh, in academia and then in the public administration in Poland uh, for quite some time. Since 2010, he served as the Inspector General for the Protection of Personal Data in Poland. And then in 2014, he was appointed as the Assistant uh, European Data Protection Supervisor. And in 2019, he was uh, promoted to the position of European Data Protection Supervisor. So, we are very honored and pleased to have him here today with us. And over to you, please, Mr. Vivarovsky. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that you will be able to hear me well and uh, uh, even probably see me, which was not uh, uh, easy for at the beginning because I had some problems with the camera. Now it seems to work. Well, uh, I have to say that this is me who is honored. Uh, because that's uh, the, the, the possibility for, from the uh, typical uh, European official uh, to say good words about the work that you do every day and the work that is uh, often, um, often treated as something obvious, normal, but actually being a, a Polish, uh, being a Polish native, uh, I speak English only as the working language and uh, my knowledge of Spanish and uh, Russian is just uh, touristic and I can 
really confirm that nothing is possible without the huge work of the translators and the interpreters. In the uh, European uh, Union, which is the organization which is proud of being at the same time the united Europe, on the other hand, the Europe of different cultures, the Europe of different languages, the Europe of different histories, and uh, Europe that is uh, enriching uh, each other. So um, let me once again say that I'm, up, uh, I'm really amazed by what I see uh, in the EU institutions uh, as far as the translating and, uh, and interpreting skills are concerned. Um, the, being a lawyer and being a lawyer working in the IT field, I can also imagine how difficult is going uh, is to go from sector to sector and to understand actually who is the one who listen, who is the one who will read the documents and which language, not only which, uh, uh, which uh, language as such, but also which dialect, which slang, professional slang and professional dialect has to be used. Well, translation and interpretation was always uh, in the loop of the data protection, data protection authorities. But I have to say that uh, for a long time, we were somehow neglecting the special situation that the translators and the interpreters have as the controllers and the processors. And uh, that's true that everything which I will say today will be a little bit simplified. So I will not take into consideration the differences that may exist between the ways that you do, that, that you do your profession, uh, starting from the individual translator and uh, finishing with the uh, interpreters working in the EU institutions. But over to, to start that, actually, I should say a few words uh, about this strange structure that we have uh, as far as the uh, interpretation of the general data protection regulation is concerned. Uh, I will try to share my screen uh, to, to help myself with the, with the presentation. I hope it will work uh, properly. Okay, let me, I, let me yeah, just okay. stop my share first mm -hmm. and see if we can give you rights to do that. Hold on. It may slightly help uh, to, to understand this quite complicated system, but if it's not possible, then I will stay with you. Okay, you should be able to do that now. Okay, I will try. Yeah, now it seems to work. Okay. I hope not, now it will be a little bit easier. So I will go from the uh, position of the normal person into the more, uh, into the more, oh, do we have, uh... okay, now it works. Uh, to the work of the a little bit more focused person on what's going on in this uh, digital world. Uh, uh, that we have uh, at the moment. So uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor, as was said so far, is the uh, institution which is uh, supervising the e European Union bodies, uh, in institutions and agencies. So I'm not the super uh, data protection supervisor for the whole Europe, but uh, the role of the EDPS uh, is not only the, the supervision of the institutions, it's also to take part in the, uh, uh, in the um, legislative process as the main advisor of the both commission that is drafting the legal acts and then the parliament and the council at the time the, the legal acts are prepared. Moreover, the, the third part of our activity is to provide the secretariat for the European Data Protection Board. And here is the first thing that we have to somehow understand on the roles in interpretation of the GDPR. The uh, guidelines on controllers and processors that were commented uh, by the uh, translators and interpreters uh, um, community were prepared by the European Data Protection Board as the general 
guidelines uh, for uh, all the people in uh, who are dealing with the, the European issues and all the people who are working on the European market uh, on how to understand these uh, two main uh, notions that appear in the in the GDPR. And EDPS was at the same time the member of the European Data Protection Board because we are as well as 27 uh, national data protection commissioners plus three ones from the European Economic uh, Area countries. Uh, we are the members of this body, but at the same time, being the one who is taking it then back to the uh, legislative process in the European Union, my role was to be the kind of representative uh, of this uh, um, community of the regulators who are accused and often uh, absolutely justifiably accused of having different interpretation in different places in Europe. But I have to say at the same time that the comments that were sent uh, to the EDPB, to the European Data Protection Board, uh, by the translators and the interpreters uh, were among 250 documents that were sent by different sectors uh, to comment uh, these uh, guidelines. Most of them, most of these comments that were received, uh, asked is this is there possible is there a possibility to have the special guidelines for this sector or for this kind of people who may have additional problems with the with the gdpr and that's a, a little bit of a, um, a surprise somehow for the uh, data protection authorities but i think also for the legislators because during the whole process of preparation of the gdpr there was a there was a one great uh, message sent to the legislators: Do not overregulate. Do not prepare the solutions for everything, which is granulated, because you don't know the market. You don't know what is the business model of the companies, and you don't know the specific situations that some professions are in, or some kind of uh, some kind of institutions may be in. So prepare the principles and we know how to observe them. And that was actually the main uh, idea of the uh, GDPR to prepare the accountability, to, to create the accountability principle, which is consisting uh, of meeting these principles that are in the, the Article 5 uh, of the GDPR. So all the main principles of the data protection in Europe. So, when the GDPR went into force, we started to hear the requests, where are the templates? Where are the checklists? Where are the guidelines? And while the guidelines were expected, and that's good that they were expected, the checklist and the templates will not uh, exist. They, they simply will not be provided by the any central body. But there is a tool which I guess is actually much closer to the expectations of uh, the of, of uh, many of the um, sectors, including your one, including your profession. And I'm very happy that uh, this uh, workshop starts uh, today, because it seems to be the road to achieve this uh, this uh, model, the model of kind of code of conduct code of conduct that can code, code the good practices that, that which done together with the data protection authorities may serve as a kind of guidelines to the society but the guidelines which are which is not given from the center of the huge knowledge and wisdom about the data protection uh, um, data protection issues because we are not the one. Of course, we are the ones who are responsible for dealing with it. But to be frank, we are, we are not able to, to imagine all the problems that may exist on the ground. And the, 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 the uh, job of being the commissioner for data protection, which, which I already do for 12 years in, on different levels, is a permanent education permanent education on how the people operating, what are the problems that they meet during this um, uh, operation. So both the European Data Protection Board, 
which will be preparing such solutions uh, for the uh, uh, generally for the uh, for the GDPR and the EDPS as the European Data Protection Supervisor, working with the EU institutions, uh, bodies, and uh, uh, and uh, agencies, we are playing the roles of the auditor and enforcer, of course, and also co consultant and educator. But what is probably the most uh, important here we are playing also the role of the negotiator. The negotiator between the expectations of different sectors and the expectations of so-called data subjects, people whose data is processed, and those who are processing this data and those who are controlling the, the resources. First of all, we have to remember that we are not protecting the data. We are protecting the human being and the data is just the uh, external uh, external way of uh, describe the person, describe the person's needs, describe the person's uh, features. But uh, actually the, per the person over this data is as important uh, as, the whole, uh, as the whole system may be, because the system is created in order to, to, to serve the human dignity. I, I know it sounds pathetic, but actually, it's very practical when you start to think that the data that you have in your files and that you decide to use for the different purposes they were uh, collected for, because you need it for the educational purposes for yourself, your company, your um, uh, entity, or use it for the training purposes, and you're keeping the data in, you're not keeping the data there, you are keeping the people there. So. Bearing in mind all that, we are trying to make this role of the negotiator in this in this field. So let me just uh, uh, at the beginning of this discussion say about uh, several topics uh, uh, that were uh, pointed to us uh, by the uh, translators and interpreters, and which I'm uh, as the, the uh, supervisor of the EU institutions, I'm ready to discuss uh, with the representatives of the translating community in the EU institutions and which EDPB, European Data Protection Board, will be definitely happy to get the concrete proposal of the code of conduct or code of good practice to get in. I'm not going to go deep in it, I'm, I, will just, uh, if, uh, I will just number some of the topics, but definitely the most important topic is, is it possible that the translator and the interpreter will become the controller? And the general answer is yes, it is possible, especially in the situation where the data which was collected for the translate for translating or for interpreting is now repurposed. And the new purpose for that is, for example, the future training of the uh, interpreters or, or translators or uh, the, the, the a preparation of the professional activity of the uh, company or, or, or the entity uh, or any other way which is not uh, following uh, the initial uh, the initial purpose uh, that was uh, at the moment when the data was collected if so if it is possible does it mean that the controller has all the duties that are laid down on the controller for example, information duty towards all the people that uh, whose data is uh, processed. That's the topic that definitely has to be discussed. And uh, can interpreting be defined as adaptation or alteration, dissemination, making available of the personal data as it is in the Article 4 of the GDPR, uh, or it should be always treated uh, as uh, repurposing and using it for the different purpose. Code of the good conduct, uh, co conduct and the good practice uh, can be used uh, for the EU translation services, but definitely it can be used for the whole community. And here is the role for the organizations like Year One. I'm happy that so many organizations were somehow involved in the preparation of this workshop. I hope that you will be able to start 
the activity which as far as I know has not been started yet uh, on the all European level and you will be able to help the whole society or the, the whole community of the translators and interpreters in uh, following uh, <coughs> the solutions uh, the, the, from the last reform of the data protection law. Uh, I decided to take part in this uh, workshop myself today in order to show how important the subject is among all these points uh, that we do for the hundreds of sectors uh, inside the DPS and inside the DPB. Why so? Because you are three stop steps ahead of the other sectors. You already started the discussion, you already know what are the basic problems, and you already have uh, the ideas how to solve them. And these are not the ideas that you are talking about in the radio or in the uh, in Twitter, but you are uh, talking about it at the meetings of the people who have something to say about the future of this profession. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore you to death with this uh, initial uh, statements. Many, many thanks, Mr. Viverovsky. It's so fascinating. So often we just see the authorities as a mass, the national data protection authorities, the European Data Protection Board, um, the European Data Protection Super Supervisor, we see them as a mass where actually we need to look beyond and understand how the different authorities work together and work together with the sectors. So we absolutely look forward to continuing on this journey and thank you so much for, for your support. We've made notes of code of good practice. I think that is also the, um, the direction that this project needs to move into. We've identified and today we're identifying many of the issues, the challenges, the grey areas, then we move on to the next stage of, of trying to find the solutions for the whole of the whole of the sector. So many thanks for joining us, us today and we look forward to sharing our report with you in, in due course. Yeah, and from my part, I would also like to thank you for your fascinating insights and also for your support in coming along today and for taking the time to properly consider all our, our points of view that we set out in the, the consultation process. Um, because as, as Raisa said, we, had, we often have the impression, you know, that you're quite far removed and it, it's, it's very heartening to us that, to see that you actually, as organisations did, take the deep consideration what we what we said and, and looked at what were the, these important issues these are important topics for translators and interpreters um, and it is important that we do produce guidelines code of practice whatever you call it so that everyone can be more compliant with gdpr so uh, a massive thank you from all the the organizers of this event and of the this entire project thank you very much i'm staying with you as the participant Okay, thank you. Okay, our next topic here, whilst I share my screen again, is um, John's introduction to our project and to the background of where this all started, entitled, Are You Ready to Take the Risk? Yes, um, so could you move on to the next slide, please, Raisa? So yes, as Raisa said, this is a general overview for so that everyone is on the same page and they know what the, the project is about and how we got to where we are today. So this all started in 2018 when Stephanie approached me about the idea of that we needed to do something that various organizations around Europe in the translated and interpreting sector needed to come together and to, to work on guidelines for the GDPR to, because there was so much confusion uh, in the social media, because there are lots of um, groups of translators and interpreters on the social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and so on and so forth. And there are also the associations, um, translation and interpreting associations around Europe were also confused about what does this new piece of legislation mean for us as a profession? So one of the first steps uh, that we took was that Fit Europe, uh, with its partners, developed uh, two uh, surveys. One was addressed at freelance interpreters and translators, and we had a massive response to that, um, I think 1,300, 1,400 people. 
So that gave us a very clear snapshot at the beginning of 2019, what the, the state of play was, uh, the awareness among translators and um, interpreters and their understanding of GDPR and their obligations and whether they were actually doing anything about the requirements in GDPR. And we also conducted a separate survey as well for translation and interpreting associations. So that only gave us, of course, part of the picture um, of what was going on with GDPR, the, the freelance interpreter and translator uh, perspective. Uh, but Fit Europe is also uh, a partner in something called the European Language Industry Survey, which is conducted every year. Uh, brings together also a very large number of uh, actors in our sector, um, translation companies, uh, training institutions, so on and so forth. And the European Commission is also heavily involved in that survey. So what we did was we started including questions in the LS survey in the set of questions which relate to translation agencies, translation companies, to get their perspective as well, so that we had a more complete picture of the, the awareness of GDPR and what, were, what was being done. And then once we had that data in place, we started uh, reaching out to other organizations around Europe and trying to put together a project team to, to push the project forward. Uh, Raisa, could you move to the next slide, please? And as uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor pointed out in his uh, very interesting talk, there are quite a lot of different interpretations of GDPR. And this is also one of the key things that started our interest in this because we were receiving reports of translators having to sign uh, contracts with translation agencies where they were being told that their role was controller or that they were joint controllers or that they were processors. So there didn't seem to be any consistent uh, understanding in the sector of what roles needed to be assigned to people. Uh, and we immediately recognized that there was a lot of potential for confusion over this issue. And so that's why we put the team together to try and figure out uh, what is the correct uh, interpretation in relation to our specific profession so that uh, everyone was empowered and that they could know if they were, for example, given a data protection agreement to sign and they were assigned the role of control that, uh, when in fact they were a processor, that they could have the document amended. So our specific aim here was to, to reduce confusion. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, Raisa? Uh, we're not going to have a poll, <laughs> move on to the next one. So these are some of the results uh, from the, the surveys that we mentioned. And again, it ties into this idea that there is was general confusion. Um, some people in the beginning of 2019, when the surveys were conducted, had taken measures to implement GDPR, but a very large percentage, 42%, so two fifths, had not taken any measures. And the next slide it shows some of the reasons why they weren't taking measures at that time, that they didn't know what the requirements were. Quite a large percentage of people back at that time thought the GDPR simply didn't apply to them. Uh, and also quite a large percentage as well um, said that they need more guidance. So this was also a, something that uh, prompted us to, to work more on getting this guidance prepared. Can okay, move on to the next slide, Pedro Raisa? And also, we've been looking at like the other general risk factors which apply um, outside our specific sector. So, so far, I've looked at the sort of reasons why, as a sector, we became very interested in GDPR and put the project together. But also, there's things happening outside the translation and interpreting sector that are very relevant here. So, the number of complaints uh, about GDPR issues has been rising constantly um, since 2018. Uh, the number of cases being reported to the national authorities is on the rise. The number of cases being investigated is also on the rise. Uh, there's also a rise in the number of staff working at the data protection authorities and the budget that they have to investigate GDPR issues. The Court of Justice has also have, had to handle quite a lot of cases relating to the interpretation of GDPR. So a lot of issues are becoming clearer or unclearer. Uh, if you Consider the, the Shrem, or oh, sorry, it is clear, it clarified certain things, the Shrem's judgment. Uh, overall awareness among uh, citizens all around Europe 
about GDPR and what it means for them is on the increase. And also tied into this idea of complaints and the number of cases being reported, uh, and the number of cases being investigated, there is also a very large increase in the number of fines which are being imposed. It, fines are, of course, only just one of the, the measures available to the data protection authorities, but it is interesting that certain activities that uh, translators and interpreters engage in could potentially attract fines. If we look to the next slide, please, Raisa. So here we have some data about the fines. So up until September 2021, there were 845 fines imposed all around Europe. Uh, that figure is now over 900. And we did some analysis of the, the data, some data crunching. And in September 21, uh, we saw that around 7.2% of the fines related to individuals. We defined individuals as freelance, not as freelance translators or interpreters, because there are no fines specifically relating to uh, translators and interpreters, but as an individual person or a, a small business. Uh, and we looked at all this data and we realized that the sort of activities that, that were attracting fines were the sort of things that translators might do. For example, uh, sending emails by CC in people instead of using BCC. There is a specific case about that. Uh, we don't have time to go into all those issues today, but it is one of the things that we took into consideration in this entire project and putting it together. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Raisa. So one of the questions we also asked in our survey was, so what sort of information do you need? And again, this is interesting because it reflects what uh, the European Data Protection Supervisor was telling us um, only a few minutes ago, that people wanted model documents, that people want clear guidelines. So in that sense, our um, profession is very much a, like other professions and other sectors out there. That there is this strong demand for, for more information. So again, that's what we're one of the things we're trying to do in this, in this project overall. Um, the next slide, please, Raisa. So if I had to, to summarize, the, the general aim of this project is, and again, this ties in very nicely to what the, the data protection supervisor was saying, that it's about safeguarding people. It's not about safeguarding data. So we're interested in safeguarding language service providers. And you might hear this term quite a lot during the course of today's event, because it's the term that we have decided to use generally. So as a way of referring to both individual translators and interpreters, so freelancers and language service companies, translation agencies, translation companies, because our general point of view that has emerged through discussions as part of this project is that we're all basically in the same boat. So it doesn't matter whether you are a translator or a translation agency. Uh, we need all sides to have a clear understanding of how GDPR applies to our sector. And so the aim is in developing these guidelines and developing a code of conduct, a code of practice for our sector is that we can safeguard language service providers. And we seek to do this by improving our understanding of GDPR, awareness of how it applies to our sector. And so in doing this, that we can actually protect uh, data subjects and their rights and freedoms. And uh, also because, and again, a point which was raised by the European Data Protection Supervisor is that these issues are not just relevant in one country. There's a lot of trade and interaction across European borders, um, translation cuts across uh, boundaries and borders. And so it's important to everyone along the chain, no matter where the translator, so the translator could be in one uh, country, the translation agency in another, the client in another, so that we have a clear set of guidelines and rules and a clear understanding for everyone in that chain so that the protection is complete all along the chain. So that, that's a, a general summary of the aim of our project. And one of the, the first practical steps that we did was uh, last year, uh, in partnership with the EU ATC, uh, a document called Guidance on Data in Translated Content was produced, which uh, examined or set, or rather set out our understanding of how data in the documents that we translate uh, should be handled. 
uh, it was uh, based on the, in large part on the response that we provided to the European Commission, or sorry, to the European Data Protection Board when it sent out its, um, its guidance on uh, controllers and processors. And if you haven't uh, accessed this document, we would certainly recommend that you go and find it and read it because it provides a lot of very sound and um, comprehensive advice about how you should be handling data in translated content. And then Rice, if you could move to the last slide of the presentation. So that was the state of play up until uh, 2021. Of course, COVID had impacted everything uh, about the project. So there was some delay in moving the project forward. Uh, in the autumn of 2021, we eventually were able to issue a call for experts to, to move the project forward. And we see today the, the results of the, this call for experts. We have a, a very stellar team of people from all around Europe and diverse backgrounds. Um, and we will introduce them in more detail in the, the next um, part of the, the, the conference today. Uh, we, so once we had selected the experts, we set up a working group. Um, we were able over the course of uh, last autumn and winter to have four meetings to discuss a whole series of questions which we had identified which are very relevant to our sector and included key issues that needed clarification. Um, and the result of this entire process of deliberation and discussion with the experts who cover a wide and diverse uh, number of areas is today's conference which is provided with the kind uh, support of the European Commission. And uh, as Mr. Nadepa said at the very beginning as well, uh, this will be followed by a detailed report. So it is uh, very true that this is just a step in the entire process of getting towards the guidelines or the uh, code of conduct or the code of good practice or whatever you want to call it. So there is more work to be done uh, and we are, very hopeful that within the next year or so that the, we will have worked out the or prepared the the, the relevant uh, code of conduct or code of good practice and we are very uh, happy that the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, has declared today that uh, the authorities at European level are very open to discussing uh, any proposals that we might uh, produce in order to ensure uh, the aim of this project which is to safeguard language service providers uh, in their understanding and awareness of GDPR and also then through that to safeguard the rights of data subjects uh, because it is uh, a simple fact of what we do is that as a sector we process huge amounts of data on a day-to-day -day basis so these guidelines this project are all essential and vital so that's uh, my basic introduction to the um, the project and we're going to move on now to the first panel discussion of the day. Many thanks, John. Can I just um, interject there? There's a couple mm -hmm. of questions that we'll, we'll briefly um, just comment on before we move on. Um, Stephen is asking about a link to the EU ATC guidance document. I'll, um, I don't have it just now, but I'll dig it out just with a, a note to say that it does date from last year, so it hasn't yet been updated with the latest information on new standard contractual clauses and so on published last year. Um, so that document will be updated with the results of, of, of what we found um, through this um, GDPR project and with latest, latest um, documentation and regulations from, from the EU as well. So when you read it, just keep that in, in mind, but I'll post a link here. There's also a question from um, David on uh, email marketing and so on. And I just wanted to mention here that this TEW GDPR project that we're doing together with, with European um, colleagues and collaborators it is only aimed at figuring out um, specifics for the translation and interpreting sectors. So for translators, interpreters, language service companies, everyone involved in, in that process. So what we aren't looking at um, are GDPR related dilemmas and questions around doing business, because that's common for all 
um, small, medium, large size businesses. And there is lots of information around that, albeit, of course, lots of confusion as well. But because we're the only ones who are able to um, provide the expertise for our sector, this is the focus that we must take here. Um, so we're excluding everything that just relates to normal running business, including marketing um, and so on. Okay, I'm just going to flip over my slides and back over to John. Okay, so now is the, the point in the day where we can actually introduce you to our, our team of experts. So we have, uh, I'm going to, to quickly run through the names and then let everyone introduce themselves uh, and explain um, how they, their background a little bit and how they are involved in translation and interpreting and their, aware, their involvement in GDPR as well. So we have Professor Malgowata Dumkiewicz from Poland. We have Melina Skondra from Greece. We have Manuel Herans from Spain. Stephanie Bogert, um, from, uh, she's from the Netherlands, but um, lives in Poland. Unfortunately, she can't be here today, as we said. We have Paweł Kamoczki. Uh, we have Zoe Mylak. We have Wojciech uh, Wawotsik and Raisa Magnab, uh, who is in Finland. So we have a quite diverse uh, team of people from uh, a lot of European countries here, uh, because we thought it was also very important in preparing this uh, project uh, that we have a, a geographical spread from different parts of, of Europe, so the different uh, perspectives and different uh, points of view were uh, brought into consideration in the project. So if we can go through the, the speakers then in uh, the order in which they appear on the screen, they can introduce themselves. So over to you, uh, Magwazata. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Magwazata Dunkiewicz. Uh, I am academic teacher uh, at uh, the Chair of Commercial Law uh, at the University uh, in Lublin. I am also a um, professional legal advisor in Poland. Uh, and personal data protection um, is one of the fields of my scientific as well as uh, professional interests. So my contribution to your discussion, uh, to your uh, issues, uh, will be uh, in the aspect of legal uh, basis and legal um, regulations uh, for um, protection of uh, personal data in this uh, translating and interpreting uh, mm -hmm. in fashion industry. Thank you very much. And Melina? Good morning to all. I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. Thank you, Fix Europe and uh, European Commission for having me in this experts group. My name is Melina Skondra. I'm a lawyer from Greece. And I am a GDPR expert, if I may so say. Uh, I am a certified information privacy professional by the uh, International Association of Privacy Professionals. And for the next few years, I also have the honor to have been appointed by the IAPP to co-chair the Greek chapter of the organization in Greece. I'm also a member of the scientific research group in IT law in the Applied Informatics School of the University of Macedonia in Greece. I've been familiar with uh, GDPR compliance in the TNDI sector since I had the chance to present also a webinar for the Greek Association of Translation of the Translators in the past and to identify the main issues in the sector uh, and the issues and challenges the sector has to face, the problems it has to surpass in order to comply with this regulation. I've been in charge of many GDPR compliance projects in Greece and in different types of businesses and sectors. And what I can say is that the TNDI sector encounters some challenges that other sectors do not have. I was really impressed by the high level of awareness and understanding the sector had in the GDPR, which was much higher than in any other sector I knew. But we will talk about all that later on. I'm really honored to be part of this expert group for Fit Your Event. I hope to be able to contribute to the compliance of the sector to this very important regulation of the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melina. Uh, Manuel? Hi, um, hi, John. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Manuel Herranz. Um, I'm here at Pangenic. Uh, we are in the group 
uh, representing a developer of anonymization solutions. We led a successful uh, anonymization project called MAPA, uh, that's multilingual anonymization for public administrations, of which I will, I will speak more later. And I'm here in the group as the, uh, the solution provider, or at least the person that builds on uh, builds uh, the technology solution that can be applied at institutions and, and corporations and companies. So uh, I'm, I'm aware, or my team is, is aware of the uh, nuances and the intricacies of, of anonymization in different languages, how easy or difficult it is, what uh, different applications uh, or different deployments represent uh, as challenges. Uh, it's not the same to try to anonymize text <clears throat> um, within a translation tool or to anonymize text that comes from a, a some legal proceedings and is fully multilingual and has no images, for example. Uh, or databases, uh, PowerPoints, uh, or format-rich text. So, well, I look for, I look forward to, to my presentation later on and bring a little demo. Thank you very much, Manuel. Pavel? Um, thank you, John. My name is Pavel Kamotsky, and uh, I hold a PhD in uh, IT law from Paris and Münster. I also hold a degree in uh, linguistics, uh, which has allowed me to work as a legal expert in the Institute for the German Language in Mannheim. Uh, so I am a lawyer uh, specialized in legal issues in all sorts of uh, language technologies with a particular focus on um, machine translation. Um, I also serve as the chair of the Clarin Legal and Ethical uh, Issues Committee. Uh, Clarin is um, a, a European infrastructure for sharing uh, language resources and, and language technology. Um, I am also certified to practice as an attorney in France, um, where I live most of the time. Uh, and yes, well, thank you uh, for having me here, and I am very much looking forward to the discussion that will certainly be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. Zoe? Hi there. Um, my name is Zoe Milak, and I'm a staff translator for Banca d'Italia, which is Italy's central bank and a member of the Eurosystem. Um, in addition to that, I have a legal background and 20 plus or so years of experience as a freelance translator and institutional translator and working in translation agencies. So I've seen a bit of um, every part of the industry. Obviously for Banca d'Italia, data protection in general is of major concern. And in the last couple, three years, of course, um, there has been a staff um, dedicated to uh, GDPR compliance. So I'd also kind of like to thank my colleagues there for sort of their input on this topic and giving me some background on it from an institutional standpoint. Um, and I'd like to thank, you know, John and the rest of you for inviting me be, to be here today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Zoe. Uh, Wojciech? Hello, everybody. My name is Wojciech Wojciech. I come from Poland. I'm a lawyer linguist with a uh, strong background in EU translations. I'm also CEO of Juridical, Legal and Financial Translations which is a provider of legal translations for EU institutions and international courts. Uh, I'm also a member of board of TEPIS, a specialized and sworn translator society from Poland and member of board of POLOT, uh, which is association of uh, Polish uh, language service providers. Uh, my um, academic interests focus on machine translation in the legal sector and public administration uh, and um, good practices on using um, properly uh, such solutions for in the uh, in the legal and uh, language industry. Uh, I hope to have uh, interesting and uh, fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wojciech. And Raisa, could you say a few words about yourself? Thanks, John. 
My name is Raisa McNabb. Um, I am translator by training, Finnish with French and, and English. Um, but my career has been spent in the language services industry in a language service company. And I now work as CEO at the UK's Association of Translation Companies. But today I represent European language service companies as the EU, the European Union of Associations of Translation Companies, the EU ATC's GDPR representative. I'm the author of the uh, aforementioned GDPR and uh, personal data in content for translation guide for the EU ATC, and I will also be updating that later on. Um, I don't have a legal background, um, which is why I'm so glad we have so many legal experts here. It has um, led to some really, really interesting discussions. My angle into this project and my expertise is in the um, practical application of GDPR at language service providers, whether it's uh, freelancers or language service companies. And I'm especially interested in, in the element of how um, we can mitigate the risks around GDPR implementation, the risks to the rights and freedoms of, of data subjects. Um, so that's my, my angle on here. And maybe John, you can now introduce yourself as well. Yeah, and I am John O'Shea. I am the recently elected chairperson of Fit Europe, and I previously served on the board of Fit Europe as a board member. In my professional uh, career, I am a legal translator from Greek to English. I've been doing that for about 25 years uh, or so. And prior to that, I used to teach uh, European and environmental law. So I also have a legal background. Um, and I'm very glad that we have been able to put together this, this team. Um, so what we've been talking about so far this morning is the need for more awareness uh, among in our sector about GDPR and also awareness of the risks which arise and also the bad practices which exist out there uh, that need to be changed and addressed. Uh, but a sort of very general question, um, possibly to one of our lawyers, maybe to Pavel or to Melina. What, could you explain to our audience today why it is so important to be compliant or to try to be compliant with the, the GDPR? Who would like to take the question? Pavel, maybe first, then Melina. Uh, all right. Well, uh, I think complying with the law is a value in and of itself. Uh, so um, <laughs> I, I, I think according to the, you know, the, the, the view on law and society, which is my view, um, uh, respecting the law is part of uh, being a, a good, respectable citizen, which is in itself a, a, a value. And I think that this is why most people actually follow uh, the law, but we can also take a more less idealistic view, a more pragmatic view, uh, if you will, and uh, say that it is worth uh, being, I mean, complying with the law is worthwhile uh, because it allows to avoid uh, sanctions. And there are considerable uh, sanctions in the GDPR. Uh, I don't think we should spend too much time talking about them because our purpose here is not fear mongering, but rather uh, um, um, discussing the, the, the practical ways to become compliant in a way that does not harm uh, translators' daily activities uh, or, or impact them in, 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 in a way that would be seen as too severe. So I don't think we should concentrate on sanctions. Um, so let me take this idealistic view. Uh, it is worth complying with the GDPR because, uh, well, if you comply with the law, you are a good citizen, uh, an honorable citizen. So in, in itself, that's, this is a value worth uh, aspiring to and, and achieving. I wonder what's Melina's uh, view on that question. Uh, I would only add to what Paul said that uh, it is uh, of 
critical importance to comply with the GDPR because the GDPR uh, was put in place in order to protect a vital fundamental right, which is data protection. Data protection in, in, in the EU is um, a fundamental human right, as you may know. So complying with the GDPR means respecting a fundamental human right. I don't think that I, I would have anything more to add to that. I think um, the IDP, uh, Mr. Dvorowski said, already answered the why on uh, this uh, question. And um, I think also that um, complying with any legislation, uh, since we are contacting a business, uh, makes us more, um, um, more competitive towards our clients because uh, as uh, awareness is growing uh, continuously around Europe on uh, the data protection, uh, data subjects are uh, expecting every um, businessman and every organization to respect its uh, privacy and its rights. So it is going to select between uh, different um, companies or organizations, the ones that do respect uh, its rights. Thank you very much for that, Melina. Uh, so that brings me to the next question. So you mentioned again the European Data Protection uh, Supervisor, and he mentioned about this idea of principles, and one of the ones he mentioned was accountability. So um, could you or Pavel, as our legal experts, uh, talk about what you think are the most important uh, data protection principles for the translation and interpreting sector that we need to bear in mind? Yes, John. Um, well, one of the nice things about the way that the GDPR is, is drafted is that it contains uh, a list of rather clear general principles of data protection. And I think that if there is only one article of the GDPR that you can read in uh, your life, then make it uh, Article 5, the one with um, the list of um, um, data protection principles. Um, of course, all those principles are equally important, but if you ask me which are the most relevant for translators, I would say well, there is a number of them. There are several uh, several such principles uh, that might be that are in danger of being overlooked in um, in uh, the work of a translator. One of those principles is transparency. It's a principle that says that the uh, data subject, that is the person that the data referred to, uh, should be informed uh, in a transparent way, in a clear way, uh, about various aspects regarding the processing of uh, his or her data. Um, on a more, uh, even more practical uh, note, there is the principle of uh, storage limitation that, to put it simply, says that one cannot keep uh, personal data indefinitely, personal data can only be stored, kept uh, for um, as long as necessary to achieve the, the purposes for which the data are being processed. Um, so if you no longer need the data, then uh, the data should be uh, deleted or anonymized. Uh, a principle that is closely related to uh, storage limitation is the principle of data minimization. Uh, that says that one should not collect and process and store, including uh, more data than necessary to achieve the, uh, the purposes. And this has very practical um, application in, um, in the translation sector. Um, so if you are approached by a client uh, and um, you, of course, you need uh, the data to, you need the client's data, you need the, the client's information has, uh, well, you may need his email address, depending on the circumstances, you may need 
his uh, postal address uh, to be able to bill your uh, services to the client, but you should not collect more than what's strictly necessary for you to receive the payment for, for, for the services. So for instance, collecting the client's date of birth or place of birth would be uh, excessive uh, from the point of view of the purpose of you know, getting paid for, for the translation service. Um, um, there is also the principle of uh, data, data security, uh, which says that the data should be kept safe and there should be organizational and technical measures uh, put in place to make sure that uh, the data, personal data are, are protected against, uh, for example, unauthorized uh, access or accidental uh, deletion. So uh, keeping your client's data at a USB stick or an SD card uh, that you just throw in your pocket might not be uh, safe enough to comply with, with the GDPR. You really have to think about uh, organizational and technical measures that would keep the data uh, safe. And finally, uh, there is a principle uh, that kind of, uh, it's like in Lord of the Rings, want to rule them all. Uh, and I think that the accountability principle is the one to rule them all. Um, it's um, a, this, this accountability principle says that uh, the data controller is the one who is uh, responsible for ensuring and demonstrating compliance with the GDPR. Um, from the practical standpoint, it means that uh, every GDPR related decision should be documented uh, in case of an audit by the by a data protection authority. Uh, so uh, whenever you are the controller for the processing and you make a decision that would impact uh, the processing, for instance, you define the, the, the retention period, the, the duration for which you will store the data, or you define the organizational and technical measures to keep the data safe, these decisions uh, should be documented so that you can prove uh, in case of, of an audit and in case of uh, control uh, that, um, uh, well, you can prove that these measures uh, have indeed been implemented. Uh, so yeah, these are the principles that I think are among, these are not all the principles of the GDPR, but I think that these are the principles that are among the most uh, important ones, uh, unless anyone wants to add anything to that list. Melina, I can see Melina wants to speak. Yes, I would only add to all that Paul said, the principle of lawfulness that obliges us to always identify and find the appropriate legal basis for our processing. So uh, we, are, uh, we are not um, to process any data unless we primarily have identified the appropriate legal basis to do so. And um, we will talk about all this later on. So that's only the only thing I, I would like to add at this point. Okay, thank you very much for that, Melina. And Zoe, I have a question for you now because of your um, extensive experience in different aspects of the, this, of the translation and interpreting sector. Uh, so we've talked about the principles and we've heard uh, a lot already you know, that this is all about data. What sort of data are we talking about here in reality? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, I think we should just briefly, as we've made reference to describe the supply chain for a translation project, which very simply, the most simple way is that a client brings a document to a language service provider which can be, as you said, an agency or um, you know, a human freelance translator to have a document translated. Um, and the supply chain can be long or short. So it can be the direct contact between the client 
and um, the translator who does the translation, or you can have the agency in the middle who subcontracts it out to another language service provider, you know, a freelancer. Um, so where an LSP falls along the supply chain can be a factor in determining what, it, you know, what its obligations are under the GDPR. Um, and another factor is sort of the data itself that's being processed. And I think um, we should, again, reiterate that we're talking about personal data and not just, you know, data confidentiality as um, a general concept. So what kind of personal data are, are we as translators likely to encounter that would bring us under the, the umbrella of the GDPR? And basically there are two categories, which would be administrative data and the personal data that would be contained in documents that we translate. And administrative data would be just like the data that the LSP would collect from its client um, to perform its business functions to, you know, to invoice or to project tracking or preparing contracts and such. And examples of these would be, you know, getting your, your client's name, address, you know, tax payer identification number. Um, it could also include if you're dealing with, you know, your client as a company, for example, um, you know, employee, the, the contact information of the employee that you have to deal with, but that's, can, you know, that's, there's some subtleties to that, that maybe we should put aside for now. Um, the other kind of data is sort of that contained in the documents, the document itself that we translate, which would be like medical records, an obvious one, which also has special protection of the GDPR, um, birth certificates, death certificates, um, also legal documents would you know contain reference to identifying identifying information on on data subjects so sort of putting these two factors together supply chain and data type is will kind of help us determine what an lsp's obligations are under the gdpr okay and can you on a related point can you i think of any situations where uh there might not be data in documents at all Oh, well, uh, well, for example, I, um, the most, well, I think that's many of the translations that we do, again, we're talking about personal data. So we might, that's why I specified something like a birth certificate, because that is very obviously personal data it has the name and has the, you know, if you have um, a social security number or whatever it might be called in your particular jurisdiction, you know, address your parents' names, everything that will allow someone who has access to the document to identify you. Um, but, you know, if someone were to come in and they just want to translate, you know, um, you, know, a, 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 you know, a poem or something, that's not the kind of data that we're talking about that has to be protected because it doesn't identify a data subject. So we have to sort of be very, you know, again, it's not just respecting our cust our client's confidentiality in general, um, but very specifically data that identifies a person. Mm. Yeah, um, one other thing that immediately jumps out to me as well is like technical manuals uh, would not have personal mm -hmm. data in them typically. And again, that accounts for maybe a, a quite a large proportion of what it gets translated. And so GDPR would not mm -hmm. be relevant to that particular aspect, but it would be relevant to the right. administration of data Fair. mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that for that mm -hmm. clarification, Zoe. Um, if I could ask a question now to, to Wojtek. So we've talked a little bit now about the general principles and about the, the type of data, uh, but then what are we doing with the data? So how are we processing? How are we handling it? What does the, the GDPR say about that? And how is that relevant to our sector, to the TNI sector? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, it complements to uh, some extent uh, answer given uh, by Zoe. Mm, uh, first of all, we are processing uh, data of our clients. It's a kind of uh, administrative um, processing uh, data which are processed in the context of standard business activities, um, which are not specific only for uh, translation and uh, interpretation sector. Uh, this is uh, in purpose to identify, identify clients, to communicate with them, send quotes, accept jobs, um, issue invoices, um, and perform uh, some promotional uh, and advertising uh, activities. 
so uh, this is a type of processing of data uh, which is common for all business sectors. Um, but uh, we also process uh, data of uh, um, persons, uh, data subjects uh, who are part of our uh, supply chain. Uh, I mean here, uh, data of our suppliers, um, mainly uh, our subcontractor, subcontracted uh, LSPs, uh, agents, uh, smaller uh, agencies or specialized agencies or uh, individual uh, translators. Uh, who are working for us, uh, and we are processing their data, um, storing their names, their contact details, uh, processing them, um, keeping them in our databases. Uh, so uh, these are not also not not very specific and and uh, um, limited only to uh, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, data processing is not specific and limited to uh, translation and in interpretation industry uh, but uh, there is a kind of specificity um, in, the, in in this uh, type of processing data because of uh, the very 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 long uh, supply chain uh, very often uh, it's uh, uh, in a lot of cases it's even un untraceable um the, the the first client um who gets uh, assignment from from the end client um, uh, which is a big agency uh can even doesn't know who who will be the the, the final um the final contractor the final um, person or, or uh, entity uh, doing the translation uh which is not a very uh, good solution uh in context of GDPR uh, compliance, uh, but uh, this is uh, our reality. So we have to take uh, that uh, perspective uh, into account also in, uh, working on, on, on our guidelines. Uh, and uh, the most specific type of uh, data processing uh, which uh, we um, have to deal with um, on a daily basis in, in our industry is uh, the processing data contained in, in the translated content, uh, meaning in uh, written documents and recordings. Um, and uh, this is the, the most uh, typical uh, and specific for, um, for our daily, daily business. Uh, and in this context, we process data for um, the need of, for the purpose of doing the translation, for preparing the translation memories, uh, for managing, for storing, uh, for aligning um, um, parallel texts, uh, for uh, reusing the data for another assignments. Um, and the very interesting uh, case uh, of uh, processing data is uh, the interpretation, the interpreting services, uh, which as such uh, is not a part of uh, processing um, personal data as long as uh, uh, the interpretation is being recorded. Uh, and uh, this uh, produces uh, some uh, additional issues uh, we have to uh, discuss, we have to think over uh, regarding who um, is responsible for, for recording, who keeps, who stores uh, the recording. Um, uh, and uh, then who, whose role is uh, being the, uh, the controller and processor. Um, in this case, interpreters should be very careful uh, for um, recording uh, interpretations for their own purposes. And also uh, in case of uh, dealing with uh, some reference materials uh, when preparing for, uh, for, interpre for providing interpretation services. Uh, in that case, uh, they should also um, bear in mind that uh, they should uh, receive uh, consents uh, from uh, and sign uh, necessary agreements with uh, with their clients. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. So you you mentioned when you were talking there about roles. So if I could maybe go back to to Zoe. Um, mm -hmm. 
And also, this is something that ties into to what the, the European Data Protection Supervisor was saying this morning about the importance of identifying the roles. And it's one of the key things that we've identified as being problematic. So are we controllers or are we processors? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you answer that pretty well, good question. <laughs> well, I think I, um, this kind of also goes back to the idea of the supply chain. Um, and the GDPR defines a data controller as a natural legal person or public authority agency or other body which alone or jointly with others determines the purpose and the means of the processing of the data of personal data and the key words here are purpose and means so um you know what are what are our purpose and means and essentially our purpose is sort of why are we processing this data why are we doing this translation and the means reference to kind of the how, how is this work being done? And as we saw, um, the one who decides these two questions is, the, is con- classified as the data controller. Instead, the data processor is the one who processes the data on behalf of the data controller. So the data processor follows the instructions of the data controller on how to process the data. So kind of going back to the idea that we were talking about the different types of data, you know, how does, um, how do these two roles relate to um, the type of data? And we said before that for administrative data, uh, as we said, sort of like in the, as, um, because it relates sort of to like the internal business processes. In that case, the, the LSP would be the data controller, and, and why is that? Because the LSP is collecting data from its client on the client, or if you're talking about a freelancer on the translation agency that engaged it to do the translation um, um, for its own business-related functions like invoicing and such, so the name, the address, etc. cetera. Um, so in this case, the LSP, first of all, is it deciding on the purpose? Yes, it's deciding why it needs this data and that's for, you know, to cut, carry out its administrative tasks connected to managing the account. And is it deciding on the means? Um, well, basically it's deciding how it's gonna use that data to prepare the invoice or make entries in its records or such. Um, and so I said, going back to the supply chain, in, in effect, let's say you have the client at the top of the supply chain and you might have an agency and then you have a freelance translator below. Well, the freelance translator, even though they're at the bottom of this chain, is still the data controller with respect to the the ring right above it, um, which would be the agency, which then, of course, it's a data controller to the ring above that, you know, the client as far as administrative data goes, um, because it is collecting it for its own business purposes and is processing it for those purposes. So, as far as however the data in the documents themselves to be translated goes, um, it's the situation is, is almost, um, it is the reverse, basically. It's the client who comes, who has a reason. So it has a purpose for this document that is being translated. Um, it, so, and it decides on the means, which is namely hiring an LSP, person, agency, whatever, to translate the document. But this kind of, raises the question is what exactly does means mean in this kind of a situation? Because, you know, other than saying that I want a document translated from, you know, language A to language B, does a client generally really know what the, pro- you know, the process of translation entails? You know, uh, they could, or they might just go to a translation agency or an LSP as the, a professional and entrust in the professional um, has the technical know-how to do a translation. So it doesn't need to know the details, but it knows that it's entrusting its job to this professional. So in this case, um, what does means mean? Well, it seems that the guidelines and the GDPR leave us a little bit of flexibility here, making a distinction between what is an essential mean and what's not essential. And an essential mean is essentially in this supply chain that we discussed is the client has decided that it's going to engage a professional to provide a service to, you know, to the client. Um, non-essential, those are essential. Those are those that are means that are left to the discretion of the professional that's engaged. Because, like so for example, the software that a translation translator might use 
the cat tools, a dictionary um, or such. And I think we'll also be talking about subprocessing uh, later. So does this rise to the level of the means? Um, and, and generally we would say, no, it doesn't because we're talking about just merely the technical aspects of performing um, the work and not the overarching means, which is decided by the data controller who has decided to engage a professional to provide the service to him or her or it, um, which is exactly why one would hire a professional in the first place because you don't have that expertise. So in this relationship, again, the client is the controller because it has decided the purpose, it's decided the why, it's decided the how, the how, I'm gonna get a professional to do this job for me. But the professional who has that technical expertise is the one that then decides sort of the minutia of how the process, how the product is gonna be generated. Okay, thank you very, very much for that. And on a somewhat similar or related point, Raisa, so we, we heard a little bit about like what uh, the processing that happens. Uh, so what if the, the LSP in our situation here decides that he wants to do something else with data to process it, in, like maybe to take all this data that uh, is already in his or her possession and to, to use it to train uh, a machine engine or something like that, or to use it to in... Um, a, a translation uh, memory or something like that. So do you have anything what to add, say about that? This is, this, this is one of the, the key questions that we have in the industry, because of course we know that translation memories, the data uh, that we've translated is, is one of our biggest assets. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in the afternoon session, but fundamentally, and, and we've already heard that from um, Mr. Vivirovsky this, this morning, that there is a real, risk that the processor, the LSP or the subprocessor, whoever they, they subcontract to do the work, um, turns from a processor or a subprocessor to a controller because they're taking the data provided by the controller and doing something different with it. And I think here we have one of the biggest clashes, the biggest gray areas that we haven't yet addressed as an industry to say, okay, what can we do with our translation memories? How should we approach this issue? What do we do with legacy content and so on? These are some of the questions that we'll, we'll come back to with our legal experts this afternoon. Fundamentally, I think we have some hard, um, hard decisions to make about our data uh, for us to say, actually, what do we need to do in order to comply with, with, with GDPR here? I think fundamentally, one of the key elements in everything that we do um, is to try and figure out what can we, what kind of processes can we put in place to mitigate the risk or minimize the risk or um, remove the personal data. Because although we talk about all these sorts of complexities around roles and what do we do with, with content for translation and so on, fundamentally, if there is no personal data in the content that we translate, there is no GDPR liability. So what can we do in order to remove that liability so that we um, have got data that we can do something more, more with? But join, join us this afternoon to um, go a little bit into more detail about all, all of that. Thanks, Raisa. And Pavel, I saw that you had raised your hand. Did you want to, to say something? Uh, yes, uh, I, I mean, in, in, in my experience, uh, when we start talking about controllers and processors, and we start using these two words in uh, one sentence, uh, uh, very close to each other, the lay audience uh, gets tends to tends to get get lost. And I think it's worth spending an extra minute to make sure that to you know get these things straight and make sure that our audience is is following us. Uh, this terminology in English, especially for non-native speakers, might be slightly uh, counterintuitive. So uh, the the controller is the one who is defining the means and purposes of the processing, at least the essential means and purposes of the processing. Uh, and he's really responsible for uh, GDPR compliance. It's worth noting that in French or in German, 
the controller is actually called the responsible one, the, the person who bears the responsibility for the processing. Uh, responsible de traitement. Uh, and I, I, I think uh, it's, it's important to bear this, this in mind. Controller is, is responsible. Uh, the processor, uh, however, is processing data on behalf of the controller uh, and um, uh, in the French terminology, this role is called sous-traitant, which translates directly as subcontractor. Uh, so um, the the controller. So because I'm I'm, I'm seeing the, the chat and I and I see the, the questions, it's also that these two roles, when uh, they are not assigned. Uh, permanently, once you are the controller for one processing, you'll be the controller forever for, for all processings. It does not work like that. It depends on uh, the processing. So the translator or the, the, the LSP is actually perform, performing in its daily practice several types of uh, processing operations. And it's important to distinguish at least between uh, two fundamental types, which is the processing, the actual translation that is processing of the data in the translated document. And for this processing, uh, we believe that at least in general, the client is uh, the controller and the LSP, the, the translator is the processor. Uh, but for another type of data processing, that is the processing of administrative data, the data that we call administrative data in this project, but these are the data necessary for invoicing, for example, or complying with uh, legal obligations. Um, uh, for this type of data, uh, the LSP, uh, the, the translator is uh, the controller and then we can have processors, uh, of course. But, uh, and I think that this distinction is really fundamental. I haven't added anything new to what has just has already been said. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute uh, to, to, to make sure that the audience is-, is well, with Thank us. you very, very much for that, uh, Pavel. And it also brings, uh, ties in quite nicely then to the next question that I wanted to ask anyhow. So we're, we're talking about controllers and processors, but what are the standard obligations which uh, apply to, to controllers? Maybe Melina, you could talk us through that. Yes, uh, I think that uh, there is no difference with other businesses and sectors as far as uh, uh, administrative data is concerned on our obligations as data controllers. Uh, our main obligation is to comply with the general principles of the GDPR that we earlier mentioned. And uh, what does that mean in practice? That means that if I, when I'm a controller, I must comply with, uh, for example, transparency, the, the principle of transparency, meaning I should have in place a, a written privacy notice to hand to my data subjects or to publish it online, perhaps. In this privacy notice, I should be very transparent on, on why am I going to process their data, on uh, what legal basis am I going to uh, rely on, on uh, how long my processing is going to last, on who the recipients of the data might be, etc. on the rights the data subjects have about their data, etc., etc. This is uh, a vital obligation of every um, controller. So first one, privacy notice to comply with transparency. Uh, principle. We, uh, I early, earlier mentioned the um, legal basis. When we are controllers, we decide on the why and the how, as uh, Zoe said, of the processing. That means that we are uh, responsible for choosing and um, identifying or which is the appropriate legal basis for every different processing operator operation we are going to to do. So, um, for example, uh, a legal basis, 
I'm, uh, first of all, I, I should say that uh, the GDPR provides for six specific legal bases. Those are consent, um, performance of uh, a contract, legal obligation, vital in interests of a, of a natural person, uh, public interest, uh, which does not apply on us, and finally, legitimate interests. So any of the five, because I, I do not include the public interest in our case, any of the, the, the rest, five uh, other legal bases could be applicable for our processing, but we should choose the right, the right one for each uh, processing. We usually will uh, uh, rely on, um, on the second one, on, uh, comply, on the performance of a contract, as far as administrative client data is concerned. That means that we should collect uh, our client's name, uh, his telephone number, his email address in order to be able to perform the contract we have in place with him. Uh, but that does not cover the case when we have to collect his VAT number, for example, which is necessary for us to issue an invoice on him. So on that one, we should uh, rely on our legal obligation that because we have a legal obligation to issue an invoice. Um, another usual legal basis we could rely on in some cases is uh, legitimate interests of ours. For example, when we have a monitoring system in our premises uh, for the security of our premises, we cannot rely on any other legal basis than uh, in legitimate interests. But we should uh, stress out that this legal basis is not very clear because it requires us to primarily um, conduct an assessment, a legitimate interest assessment on whether uh, our interests are uh, overridden by the interests and rights of the data subject. So we could not use such a legal basis where um, the processing might be a little bit intrusive on the data subject. And last but not least, there is consent which is a very difficult legal basis because consent is freely revocable. So uh, at any time, uh, the data subject could um, decide to revoke the consent it gave us and that would leave us with no legal basis uh, from then on. And also because consent, we do not usually uh, advise to use this uh, legal basis unless there is no other applicable because the consent in order to be valid must meet some conditions. It should be uh, specified. So uh, we should ask for a granular consent on each processing we want to undergo. And uh, it, should, it, should, it should be freely given and it should be informed. Uh, so freely given would exclude using consent with almost uh, always exclude using consent as a legal basis for, uh, for example, processing employee data when we are where we are the employer, because uh, usually the employee does not is not in a position to deny to give us the, its consent. Um, the ADBB has uh, stressed out that where uh, situations with the power imbalance are uh, involved. Uh, we could not consider the consent to be freely given, so it would be not valid. And uh, also, um, <clears throat> sorry, my fault. <clears throat> so uh, another obligation we have uh, is to maintain, to keep a record of processing activities in some cases. Um, it is an instrument and a tool that would help us very much in knowing what data we have, what data we process and for which reason and for how long and what measures uh, we could take uh, about each data set. And another obligation I think is vital also is to decide and even document and write down a schedule on our retention period of uh, any different 
data set we uh, processed so that we could keep up with our legal obligations because per perhaps there are uh, different national laws that apply on uh, data retention periods. For example, in Greece, uh, we are obliged to keep uh, invoices and tax data for at least 10 years and uh, to not delete them or destroy them earlier than that. So in my retention schedule, I would have tax data um, to keep them for 10 years and not more. And um, even if there is an, a not a national law that says what to do and how long to keep uh, any different data set, then we should go back to the general principles and follow the storage limitation principle, which obliges us to not keep data for more than it is absolutely necessary for the purpose for which they were initially collected. Uh, we should also prepare a procedure, a written procedure on what we should do when we receive a data subject request. For example, uh, that the subject decides to uh, exercise his access request. We should be ready to answer this request within 30 days. So we should have in place a, a procedure that would lead us step by step to what we should do when we receive such a request. The first thing, for example, that we should do is uh, identify that this person is uh, really a data subject of ours, that we do have um, its data. The second step might be uh, find uh, the relevant data of this person, etc., etc. And it would help us very much to comply with our obligation to satisfy within this uh, uh, time frame. Um, of 30 days to our uh, data subject requests. And I should not, uh, 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 I should also mention that another written procedure I think is vital to have um, written down is the procedure on uh, data breach incidents. We should have in place a procedure that would lead us to what would we will do when, if, and when. Or, we are encountered with a data breach. Uh, such a processing might, for example, uh, mention that the first thing to do is uh, to see whether these data are personal or not, is personal or not. If it is, what to do? If it is, uh, the GDPR says that um, um, we should notify the local data protection authority within seven to two hours unless there is no risk for the other subjects at all. Even if uh, there is even a low risk, then we are obliged to notify the, uh, the local authority. And uh, if the risk is high, we should um, notify also the data subjects so that they uh, can take some measures to mitigate those risks. Uh, we could not do all that after the, the incident occurs. So we, we must be ready to uh, respond to uh, such an incident from uh, the beginning. So I think that having such a procedure is uh, fundamental for our compliance. Another thing uh, that we should do is to have in place a data processing agreements with our subcontractors and our subprocessors or processors. That is an obligation that the GDPR imposes on both controllers and processors to, when they have subprocessors. So, mm. if some uh, of our uh, subcontractors do not uh, are not willing to sign such a contract, simply we must change uh, supplier or a subcontractor because if we do not have such a processing in place, then we infringe uh, Article 28 of the GDPR. The same applies for our employees when we have such, uh, if we have employees where we are responsible for their uh, actions and um, the GDPR says that we should have in place also, also confidentiality agreements signed by them. And last but not least, at all times, we should take every appropriate technical and organizational measure in order to keep the data safe available and intact. Thank the, you very the much. Measure, the measures we are, uh, well, we are uh, expected to select and put in place 
are the measures that are appropriate for our uh, specific processing. Where there is a high risk in the processing, the measures uh, should be stricter. Where the, the risk is lower, the measures could be less strict, for example. Thank you very much, Melinda, for your very comprehensive answer. Um, so we basically talked there about uh, the situation which applies for controllers. Um, uh, Magwazata, could you run us through very quickly the, the legal basis for processing when you're a processor and maybe talk a little bit as well about the data processing agreements which uh, Melina referred to? Yes. Um... I will try. Uh, so the main thing, uh, so firstly, we have to mention that uh, the processor derives its legal uh, title, legal basis for the processing uh, of personalized data from the controller. So he has not his own purpose in uh, processing the data. And that is why uh, he must uh, act uh, within the scope defined strictly by the controller. And uh, the legal instrument for this, um, or for the ordering this process uh, is uh, called uh, data protection agreement, the uh, data processing agreement. And this uh, concluded between um, controller and processor. So uh, in our um, field, uh, it is between LSP and between his client. And uh, this agreement uh, sets out the main obligations as well as uh, subject matter, as well as duration of the processing of, uh, of the data, the nature of this processing, and the categories of data uh, which um, are uh, to be processed. Uh, so um, this agreement uh, should be written down because uh, GDPR um, impose, um, imposes um, a demand that it should be in writing, uh, including in el electronic form. So it means that uh, the main provisions uh, of the agreement um, should be written down, but uh, the manner um, uh, of our recording um, can be uh, both in paper or uh, in electronic form. So it, it, it is not necessary to be written in the in paper yeah, in this traditional form. Um, of course, uh, there is no definition of electronic form uh, in EU law, uh, but we have definition of electronic signature. But uh, it's, it's, um, it is not, um, uh, it is not um, very clear if uh, we have to um, uh, sign this uh, document, uh, which we uh, conclude in electronic form, in one of uh, specific types of electronic signatures. Because we have in the European Union um, advanced electronic signatures and uh, uh, let's call it um, uh, not advanced, so other uh, electronic signatures. Uh, and there are no um, strict rules that we have to sign this document in one of these advanced electronic forms. So we can, um, we can uh, assume that any form of uh, writing it down in electronic form is sufficient. Uh, but uh, the most um, uh, obvious requirement uh, from the uh, Article 28 uh, is that we have to um, conclude this agreement before we start uh, processing uh, data uh, which we obtain from our client. And uh, <clears throat> the main um, conclusion, uh, the, the main consequence of that agreement uh, is that after we conclude it uh, and we obtain the data, uh, we have to process the data only on documented instructions uh, from the controller. So uh, we have to bear in mind that it is our uh, to be on the safe side. We have uh, some. Uh, we have to have some documentation of these instructions. So um, uh, <clears throat> if we just uh, want to uh, translate it and send it back to to uh, to uh, our client. Uh, who is controller in that case, um, we should try to um, take uh, from him instructions on uh, in what in which way we have to um, submit uh, him um, a translation. It, it should be his decision. So if we uh, have to um, send it um, via uh, electronic um, mail, uh, 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 email or uh, in, in writing in, in, in paper. Uh, it should be his decision. So uh, we have to um, to be to be on the safe side. We have to uh, have document documented instructions from the controller. 
um, other obligations, other standard obligation, uh, obligations um, which uh, should be set out in the agreement is that we have to ensure that any person that from our staff authorized to process the personal data uh, obtained from the client have committed themselves, and as Melina said, to confidentiality uh, or are under appropriate statutory obligation. But because it, it can be that in some member states we have uh, such um, sworn translation uh, acts that uh, stipulates such obligations uh, as legal obligations um, directly from uh, from the act. Yes, so we should bear it in mind. Uh, then, um, uh, which Melina uh, is already uh, mentioned, um, the obligation of uh, implementing um, such organizational and um, technical measures. Uh, which are appropriate to uh, ensure security uh, level appropriate to the risk of um, data processing. So in this obligation, we are on the same side as controller. So there is no difference uh, as well uh, as controller. We have uh, as a processor, we have to um, secure this uh, level of uh, protection. Um, then um, we have to um, bear in mind that the very um, uh, very important obligation is that uh, connected with the um, conclusion uh, with the finishing of the um, of the process of uh, translating because um, this contract should stipulate should uh, should set out that um, after uh, we finish our uh, data processing our uh, service um, uh, connected with data processing uh, on the choice of the controller, we have to delay or return all the personal data to the controller. Um, and um, this purpose of, um, of um, processing, uh, which is determined by the controller, is strictly um, connected with the time, with the duration of the processing. So we cannot exceed um, in the agreement, um, in, uh, this um, purpose, uh, because purpose is strictly connect connected with duration. Uh, it means that durations uh, duration is governed by purpose. Uh, so, if we definitely finish our services, um, so uh, our translation is accepted, and we submit it, and it is accepted, uh, um, not uh, um, uh, any. Um, amendments are not necessary. It means that the purpose is um, uh, finished, is uh, uh, is obtained, and further processing of the data means that we are turning into controller with all consequences that Melina had uh, uh, already mentioned, uh, has already mentioned. So um, these are the basic. Uh, basic um, uh, obligations and uh, the list of uh, um, provisions um, uh, which are necessary in the agreement uh, is in Article 28. Uh, yes, we have uh, um, we have this um, <clears throat> list very uh, specific. Um, so that's the main. Uh, okay, and what about then in relation the the idea of standard contractual clauses? How does that relate to uh, data processing agreements and these standard obligations? So we have this um, document uh, which allows us uh, to um, to uh, use standard um, standard um, uh, obligations, uh, but it means that we. Um, I will. Uh, it's. Um, a regulation and um, so you have probably um, the um, uh, well it's a re EU regulation on standard contractual clauses and uh, it means that if you choose that way uh, you uh, sign your um, data as a processor and your client as a controller and uh, you uh, are obliged to um, uh, use all this <coughs> Contractual, uh, standard contractual clauses, which uh, our um, European Union legislator stated, and that means that you cannot change them. And uh, and uh, this um, contractual stand, uh, standard contractual clauses um, 
somehow uh, can be um, adapted um, i mean only in this uh, form that you can fill in uh, in the gaps in the gaps mm, but on other the annexes yes uh, so duration um, purpose uh, category of data so this is to be um, filled in but mm. other uh, obligations are just as they are set out in this document so uh, okay so it's, it's another way of of doing it but it's more set in stone but uh, maybe you can you can just um, try um, uh, treat it as a um, as something that you can uh, put into your own <coughs> agreement and mm. uh, you be more elastic with this mm. uh, in um, with, <coughs> with, uh, with provisions so. And also, like on a related point, then, so what happens if the controller is not giving you a data processing agreement to sign? Um, so you should, uh, um, it is advisable, you should uh, have your own draft of such an agreement to um, to take, to, 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 to give to, 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 to the uh, controller to sign it up. Yes. So. Um, and what yeah, happens if they refuse? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Yes, but what, what happens if the controller refuses to sign the, the data protection agreement? Okay, if you refuse. Uh, well, uh, you cannot process the data, personal data. So you can um, ask him to anonymize data in this uh, content and then send you the, just uh, the, the text, which <coughs> are, uh, you know, uh, from which this data uh, well, uh, removed, uh, were removed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so on some more related questions about these um, oh, data processing agreements obligations, maybe we switch now to, to Wojtek and, uh, or Zoe. Um, a lot of times we're, we, we see in data protection agreements that come from, say, translation agencies where they want to audit uh, a freelance translator about uh, compliance with GDPR. Um, Zoe, maybe you could say something about that. Uh, well, as processors, we are, as we said, obliged to um, assist the, the, the controller, excuse me, in fulfilling its obligations. But it's obviously um, to our benefit to try to construe it as narrowly as possible. Um, just to try to find the balance between assisting while protecting um, the confidentiality of all of our other information, all of our other files and such. So um, yes, we should in the DPA or in um, some other agreement with the DPA, specify precisely what data is um, subject to um, this audit, what we need to protect, how we're going to demonstrate or to you know sufficiently for the data controller that, uh, or if we are the controller um, to the client or the authority, that the data personal data being processed is being um, processed and protected properly. Um, and we should also specify um, to the extent that we possibly can negotiate, is the, is the audit gonna be conducted remotely, giving them access to our computer, for example, or our cloud or whatever? Or is someone gonna physically come onto the premises and you know look through the files, look through the, our computer files and such? Um, so, we have to really, uh, as professionals, try to limit access as much as possible. That is not, that, you know, that, but, but nonetheless remain compatible with conducting an audit. So, as I said, um, narrow as possible in contract, have it written down, specify um, what we have to do, what our obligations are, what kind of files that we're going to need to produce, um, maybe how we're going to keep those files and such, so that we can sort of easily extract that data or, or um, you know, demonstrate how we've protected that data in the data storage record keeping for that very specific client um, and the data that pertains to the, to the data subject for that project and sort of try to wall it off from the rest of our data. So that can be technological and, you know, again, again get it all in writing to the extent possible. Okay, thank you. And Wojtek, um, so we, if we have signed a data protection agreement with a controller, are we as translators able to use subprocessors to get someone else to do the translation for us, say? Because you uh, talked earlier on about chains or in, yeah, the, no, yeah. in the sector. In, and so once again, this is quite a tricky and problematic issue in our sector. 
um, according to earlier interpretation of uh, uh, general permission concept, uh, it was accepted that um, on the basis of such general permission, it, it's allowed to use uh, um, defined categories of subprocessors in general without listing them by name uh, in the DPA. However, uh, this interpretation changed and uh, to strictly follow a rules of GDPR, um, we are um, obliged to uh, include in the agreement the full list of uh, subprocessors. It means uh, all the um, service providers, uh, subcontractors, uh, translators, uh, reviewers, uh, providers of uh, any software, machine translation, CAD tools, accountants, and, and, and everything. So uh, it's problematic for, for all kinds of business, but especially uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, translation sector where the supply, uh, ch chain supply is uh, quite long, uh, and uh, quite hard to, to trace. Uh, it, uh, it means that uh, it, it's not even feasible um, to, uh, to, to provide the, the, the full and complete list of uh, OXA processors, but in accordance with uh, GDPR requirements, uh, it has to be done. Mm, so this is issue which uh, requires further uh, research and discussion and, uh, and guidelines. Uh, it is also problematic from the uh, mm, competition and confidentiality uh, point of view problematic because uh, we uh, as a, a provider of translation service mm, uh, giving full um, a full list of our subcontractors and translators uh, are um, this is uh, in contrary to our own interest because uh, we provide our client with, uh, with the know-how with uh, data of uh, of our um, um, staff of our translators our reviewers uh, who are uh, who we rely on uh, and uh, uh, it can also mean uh, that, uh, of course, we can um, sign um, additional agreements, uh, but uh, we know from a daily practice that um, providing too much details to our client is not in our, in our interest. So um, the other problem is that uh, the list of uh, possible subcontractors is uh, in translation industry is quite flexible and fluctuating um, because of uh, also um, availability of translators who are um, in most cases freelancers. Uh, today they are available, uh, other day they are not. Um, and and uh, providing and fulfilling translation projects using uh, in-house team uh, is not um, something uh, which is quite typical for uh, for the industry. Uh, in most cases, we are using freelance um, translators, uh, so the list of subprocessors changes uh, from day to day, uh, and it's it not it's not possible, it's not feasible to provide our clients with the full uh, database of names um, of, of our translators and reviewers. So this is uh, problematic and tricky um, and requires uh, further research and uh, analysis. Thank you very, very much for that. So we're quickly running out of time. Um, so a lot of the, the very important or really tricky issues, like the, the one Wojtek just uh, referred to, like data retention or possibly the use of uh, online tools uh, and things like that, we will be addressing uh, later in the day. So we will not uh, talk about those now. But it is interesting to point out that, yes, there are a certain category of questions which uh, have quite clear cut answers, uh, like the, the role uh, of us as processors uh, when we're dealing with the data in translated content. Um, and then there are other, this category of areas where are still grey, where more guidelines uh, need to be worked out and the, we don't have all the, the answers. Um, so I think we have uh, a couple of more minutes left, so we can take a couple of questions. 
And I, I see from the chat, there's a question from uh, that Pavel wanted to answer. Uh, that it, if we say the client is the controller, should there be differentiation based on client type? Um, Pavel, would you like to, to address that particular question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, your question, it, it's, I mean, Maria who asked that question and it's a very good question. It uh, refers to a situation where the client is a, a private individual uh, and we would have this feeling, this, this kind of ethical intuition, so to say, that in this kind of situation and dealing, dealing with the, the private individual is the professional who should assume the responsibilities. So the translator should assume the responsibilities. Uh, and this is why Maria, who asked the question, uh, uh, suggests that in, in, in such a situation, the translator should become the controller. Um, this, however, is not uh, the case. Uh, the GDPR applies to all controllers equally, regardless of their status, their, their experience. The, there is this uh, principle uh, formulated by the ancient Romans already that, uh, that some theoreticians call the eminent principle, ignorantia juris neminem excusat. Uh, so the ignoring of the law is not an excuse for anyone. So uh, even if your client is uh, a, a private individual, he is still the controller for the documents that he brings you. Uh, and you are still the processor. There are however some pitfalls in this uh, kind of situation. So the first one is what happens if the client is and his processing is covered by what's called the household exemption. So there is a, an exemption in the GDPR that says that purely domestic and household activities are not covered by the GDPR. And the traditional example is, for instance, uh, having a, a notebook with addresses and phone numbers. Now we also mention posting on social media in such a way that only your close friends can uh, consult the, the content that you posted. Uh, this is covered by the household exemption and such processing is not covered by the GDPR. Um, does it apply in the translation context? I think that the cases where this would apply would be really extremely rare. For example, if you are translating, if a client is translating his or her diplomas uh, or, or whatever sort of official documents, he usually does it to participate in some sort of recruitment or some sort of official procedure. And then the household exemption cannot apply. If someone is really translating a document for, for household activity, like translating a personal journal of a, of a, of a, of a relative, for example, uh, an ancestor, a long deceased ancestor, that can potentially still contain personal data that, that refer to people who are still, al still alive or somehow can qualify as, as personal data still. Uh, I, I think the household exemption can apply but what, then what happens with the processing is one of the most interesting questions I have been confronted with in, the, in my practice with, with the, the, the GDPR. Uh, I think Melina would disagree with me, but I think then since the controller is exempted from the GDPR by the household exemption, I think the GDPR does not apply to the processing whatsoever and it does not apply to the processor uh, either. So you can completely forget the GDPR in this sort of circumstances. Of course, in order to shield yourself from liability in case of uh, an audit, uh, it might be considered to make, to have the client sign a, a written declaration saying that this content, this document will only be used for, uh, for uh, private and domestic uh, activities. Um, yet another pitfall in dealing with individuals is that 
who don't know the law. So if an individual doesn't know the law and he's still the controller and he gives you an, an instruction, so you are the processor as a translator, you receive an instruction from your client, the controller, to process the data in a way that is not compatible with the GDPR. For example, um, keep the data for longer than necessary or uh, I don't know, process, of, well, anyway, or handle the request from uh, the data subject in a way that's not compatible with the GDPR. What if you receive instructions that are illegal, that are against the GDPR? It is, it is uh, the, the uh, processor's duty actually in such cases to inform the controller that this instruction is not compatible with the GDPR and so it cannot be carried out, cannot be acted upon, all right? Uh, and that is quite problematic. It's, it might be uh, that the European Data Protection Board actually suggests that it should be uh, stipulated in the contract what happens uh, in, 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 in such a case. So in case of a warning, if the controller insists that this processing should still be carried out, uh, the controller, the processor should, for example, be given an opportunity to uh, rescind the contract. Uh, but well, these are technicalities, but this is one of the pitfalls uh, for processors in dealing with uh, controllers who are private uh, individuals. So a very important question. Uh, thank you very, very much, answer. Pavel. Uh, thank you, and I hope that that has helped you. Okay, thank so you. we have now exceeded our, the time allotted for this panel. Uh, it's been very, very fascinating, and there are a great many issues that we still need to discuss, but we do have another panel discussion this afternoon, um, which will cover a lot of the topics that we haven't been able to address this morning. There are also lots of other questions in the chat. Um, maybe if some of the, our experts have the time and energy they could respond to questions uh in that way um or if they they write down if they take a note of the questions maybe they could respond at a future point in time to the the person asking it um uh so we have a coffee break scheduled now it was supposed to be 15 minutes but um if everyone wouldn't mind could we come back in 10 minutes so we stick to our our schedule so we'll see you all again then in at 10 minutes from now. So at 12.30 Central European time for our next uh, topic, which is about how to mitigate risks. So a, a very practical orientated uh, discussion from RISA. Thank you very much for all your attention.
So welcome back everyone to the next uh, session in today's conference about GDPR. Uh, I'm very happy to have Raisa McNabb talk to us now about how to mitigate risks in relation to GDPR and translation. Uh, and she's going to give, give us a very practical talk now about how we can do this, how we can reduce the, the risk mitigated. So over to you, uh, Raisa. Great, thank you, John. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Lovely. All right. So let's let's move on from the um, primarily legal domain to the practical domain now and talk about how we can, in practice, mitigate the risks to our businesses and to the data subject in terms of the processing that we we do. So this is a very practical approach that we're taking here. And one of our uh, breakout sessions this afternoon as well will be um, dedicated to this mitigating risk. So if there's anything further that you want to continue discussing or, or ask or, or whatever, then, then join us at the, at the breakout groups. Um, one of the things that um, many of us really struggle is essentially this idea that um, there are quite a lot of practical challenges within the sector for us. And those challenges arise from the fact that, um, especially when we talk about personal data and translated content, it is essentially quite often incidental personal data. So the processing activity, our primary processing activity is to translate content translate a document into another language. And whether or not there is personal data often doesn't really play a huge role per se. Of course, if you're translating somebody's medical record, then the personal data in that medical record plays a really um, uh, large role. But you might equally be translating other documentation that simply mentions a CEO or refers to somebody by, by name. So a lot of the personal data in the content for translation is incidental um, personal data. And the problems that arise from that is, of course, that we, especially we as, as processors, often have absolutely zero visibility on the origin of that data. And quite often our clients um, are in a similar position. That data comes from somewhere, but that data hasn't been specifically collected for the purposes of the translation. It's been collected at some point for some purposes, but that purpose may be quite far further up the food, food chain, so to speak. So there is little visibility over data origin. There is also quite often little visibility before we start as to whether there is personal data in the documentation that we translate or not. So certain types of documents are more visible, a medical record will presumably always have personal data, but other types of data, we're not going to necessarily know whether there's personal data until further down the lane. Of course, one of our challenges in practice is also that we always, pretty much always run a global activity. So we're doing transfers within the EU, we're transferring content for translation outside of the EU to adequate countries, for example, the UK um, so far and, and others as well. And we're transferring data to third countries. And um, essentially the controller should have the responsibility of uh, ensuring that those transfers are okay, that those third countries that the data is being transferred to um, are safe and equivalent, um, but often that's not the case. Another challenge, practical challenge, is that um, our assignments quite often are ad hoc. So it's not like Amazon Cloud Services that manages masses of, of, of data from its clients. Um, we translate individual documents that may be very similar from one, one day to the next or completely different from one day to the next in lots of different languages with lots of different sub-processors. And what we've also already talked about today is that data controllers, our clients, are often not aware of their obligations. So they may not be aware that there is personal data in the content for translation. 
um, they may not be aware that the translation process is, is, um, comes under GDPR, and they may, may not be aware that there needs to be a data processing agreement or standard contractual clause signed between you, the processor, and the controller. So these are all very real challenges. And when we talk about these legal, legal aspects of what we should be doing, um, we don't want to take away the practical aspects of what you see on the ground every single day of the week. So we recognize these and we want to find a way to marry these, this conflict essentially of GDPR compliance and protecting the, the, the data subjects um, rights and freedoms. And the practical work, the practical day-to-day -day work that we do where these issues are real life barriers to um, us doing our business. But at the end of the day, the bottom line still is that it, it is our responsibility also to protect the data from the data subjects, so their person and to comply with the GDPR. So we've already heard from Malgar Zata, for example, that if the um, controller is not able to give you a data pr processing agreement, um, you need to take your responsibility as a processor seriously and ensure that one is put in place. So then we come to this question of lots of moving parts, lots of, lots of different types of, of risks around our processing activities. What can we do to, first of all, identify them? And then what can we do to mitigate those risks? So let's talk about assessing risk first. Um, essentially, the one thing to uh, realize is that we've got lots of different types of LSPs. We've already said that within the context of this project, LSP we use for um, both freelancers and for language service companies, anybody who, who um, manages language services. GDPR doesn't tell you exactly what you need to do in every single instance, which is also what we heard from Mr. Vivarovsky this morning. And when you're thinking about the risks, the GDPR puts an onus on everybody to assess and identify risks, but that needs to be done from the point of view of your operations. It will be different for a larger company compared to an individual freelance um, uh, provider. It will be different depending on what types of content you, you process, what kinds of operations you do. But there's some basic principles that we need to um, take into account. And if we do that, then that risk um, landscape, if you like, will, will become a lot clearer. So contractual compliance, we've already talked about a little bit is absolutely critical. And that contractual compliance essentially means that there is a contract in place that says what you're allowed to do and how. And that same contractual compliance, which essentially should be put in place by the controller, needs to filter all the way through the supply chain, however many links there are. So um, whether you're a processor or a sub-processor, the same contractual obligation should apply to you. One of the challenges, one of the risk assessment elements that we within this industry need to go through is specifically to think about identifying and mitigating these risks, particularly for the translation activities. So we've said before that we've got certain business activities that we all carry out because we're all running um, businesses as, as, as well. There's lots of information around on, on there, but there are very specific um, elements that pertain to the translation and interpreting services that we need to identify, assess our risks, our to our own businesses, our own um, GDPR compliance through that lens. The third um, risk assessment principle that I want to highlight here is um, documentation. So carrying out a risk assessment is great and you should be doing that, um, but what's better is that you carry it out and then you document what you're doing. So think about what you're doing 
what kinds of processing activities you're carrying out and write it down so that it's clear to you and to your potential clients or the data protection authorities when they come knocking um, what you're doing and why and what have you done in order to um, identify the risk and take measures to mitigate that. So let's start with the mitigation part then. Contractual agreements. Yes, we need to have them. We need to have a contractual agreement between the controller and the processor. And we also need to have a contractual agreement between the processor and sub processor. Now, today we've already talked about um, several of these types of contractual agreements. DPA, data protection agreement. DPA is a complex um, or, or a little bit confusing as a term because DPA is also used for data protection authority. But here DPA, um, we use to mean data protection agreement. It is essentially the contractual agreement that outlines what um, is done with the, with the data, um, how, so subject matter, um, of the processing, nature and purposes of the processing, the duration of the processing, which takes us to data retention that we'll talk more about later today, types of personal data and categories, um, taking into account our specific processing activities. So a data protection agreement is a type of contractual agreement. And then we've got standard contractual clauses or SCCs that we've already mentioned also today. They are a type of agreement that you can use to put in place the relevant um, GDPR compliance requirements between the different roles or between the different um, actors in the supply chain. So the SCCs are a mechanism to contractually govern the processing activities. And there are also now um, EU SCCs for transfers to third countries. So outside of the EU and EEA and outside of um, countries that have been deemed adequate, um, like for example, the, the UK. So you don't necessarily need to have an SCC, you don't necessarily need to have a free form DPA, but you need to have a contractual agreement. The benefit of using SCCs that have been defined and um, modular templates have been created by the European um, Commission is that if you use them, fill them out and comply with them, then you're basically covered. The risk with having a free form data protection agreement is that inadvertently you do something that is not GDPR compliant. You can access the, um, the SCCs online, of course, um, both the standard contractual clauses for the roles and for transfers to third countries that are set out in modular form so that you can pick out your role and figure out what you need to, to do. Um, in Eurolex, in, in all of the um, EU languages, of course. What's good now is that today we are in a much better position in order to ensure that contractual agreements are correct and applicable throughout the supply chain. Because when we started this GDPR project, when the GDPR first came out, there were only standard contractual clauses between controller and controller or controller and processor, but there were no clauses between processor and sub-processor. So this particular gap has now been filled and we can now use SCCs throughout the chain from controller to processor, from processor to sub-processor. So contractual agreements, Absolutely, you need to have that in place. And if the controller doesn't put them in place, then you take steps to, to, to do that. My next point in mitigating risk is essentially understanding what you process. So reviewing, assessing the type of content 
and here we, we very much talk about the content in, in translation, understand what you're processing so that you understand the risk that is inherent in the type of work that you do. And here we've got very different um, uh, approaches because we've got some LSPs who uh, process hardly any personal data. They've got commercial content or um, uh, online web pages or what, whatever um, you have. And then we've got LSPs who specialize in legal translation, who day in, day out translate sensitive content with personal data, lots of it, and special um, categories of data. So in terms of mitigating risk, the GDPR doesn't tell you to do uh, risk profiling on your content. But I feel that this is a really powerful way for you to understand what is the risk to the personal data, to the rights and freedoms of the data subjects with the work that you do, with the processing you do. And again here, your client or the controller uh, further up the chain may not understand, may not have the insight to do this work. So from my point of view, this is part of the um, transparency principle, but also the accountability principle that we are the professionals, we know what we're doing, we need to be able to um, come to a position where we understand very clearly what we do and how we do it. So I would advocate content risk profiling. So understanding what you do um, and how is there personal data. If there's no personal data, there's no GDPR compliance risk. Is there personal data? Very little, completely non-sensitive and so on. The risk is much lower. Is there sensitive personal data, special categories of, of data, people's health data, information about their ethnic origin or, or so on? Consider also how you identify personal data, especially if the controller is not in a position to do that. How do you identify it? Who identifies it? How do you flag it up to everyone in the supply chain and to the controller? Is there a way for you to pre-process data so that the risk is lower, for example, by using anonymization tools that we'll hear from Manuel next? How and where do you retain data and for how long? We'll also come back to that question. Whatever you do, involve everyone in the supply chain. So even if you're, um, you're happy that your operations are okay and above the water, what happens further up or further down the supply chain? Are they also aware of these um, elements? Do they also comply with the clients, the controllers uh, requirements? Documentation, like I mentioned, is also a really um, strong way of mitigating risk. So understanding first what you need to do and then document what you do. So contractual agreements, of course, are documentation. Where are they? How can they be accessed? How do you document your assignments? How do you document the technical and organizational measures that you take to protect personal data at transit, for example, to third countries? And what kind of a risk assessment you've done for your operations, your processing, your documentation, your records, and so on. There are, within the language services um, supply chain, quite significant risks around using sub-processors and transferring content to third countries, probably more than for most other sectors, because we do a global activity. And for many translations, it is you know, we need to transfer it to third countries to translate into certain languages. So we need to understand the supply chain. We need to understand our part in the supply chain where are we? Are we processor? Are we subprocessor? Who decides? Who do we need to, to follow? And we need to ensure this compliance throughout the processor chain. We know, need to know the risks around transfers to third countries and consider how we can mitigate them. Transfers to third countries um, 
are really tricky because essentially we should be in a position to say data is being transferred to a third country outside of the EU, EEA, outside of adequate countries. Is it safe within that third country? And quite often it's very difficult for us to say that because we're not a large multinational. We don't have an army of lawyers to um, assess the, the political situation in a third country um, anywhere, but we're asked to, to, to make that judgment. So consider whether you transfer data to third countries, what countries, how can you ensure that that data is safe? How can you um, take steps to mitigate that risk? Is the controller even aware that data is being transferred to third countries? They should. Technical and organizational measures were also mentioned earlier, and those are really um, key ways of mitigating the risk to your business, to the data that, that you process. And here, um, when we're looking at analyzing the risks around the, the measures that we're taking, we should of course take into account that those measures may be different depending on whether you're an individual freelancer or whether, whether you're a company. So they're commensurate with your processing activities. But there are again, lots of different touch points at which things can go wrong or the loop can break because there's a lot of transfers within our type of processing activities. So we're transferring data from the controller to the processor. The processors have got their own data repositories. Where are they? How are they um, uh, safeguarded? There are transfers from the processor to potentially lots of sub-processors. There are the sub-processors data repositories. And then there is the whole um, transfer back to the controller. How is that done? How is the data being kept safe and secure throughout these by using technical and organizational measures? And here we're talking about data protection, um, encryption, for example, um, ways with which we can ensure that the data that we transfer, that we process, doesn't get intercepted and used for something else, um, which reduces the risk for data breach. Data retention um, is something that we'll come back to a little bit later on but has already been highlighted as a key uh, risk area for us. And here I would come back to this idea again um, to say, if there's no personal data, there's no GDPR compliance risk. Of course, there may be other risks um, around data protection. Can we use tools, technologies to mitigate that risk, to lower that risk, anonymization, for example? Fundamentally, like we've heard already, um, the controller decides what is being done to the data. Where does the data go? We need to assume our responsibility um, with transparency of our supply chain, of our processes, so that the controller has got visibility over what's being uh, done to the data. So the controller should decide and the supply chain all throughout it and back again should follow that. So within the context of this TEW GDPR project, um, there are still a lot of gray areas and, and we've talked about those and we need to continue working together in order to figure out what we can do with our practical day-to-day -day life stay compliant with the GDPR without drastically uh, jeopardizing our entire sector or our entire business activities. I'm sure we still need to um, have title of compliance. There are still certain things that we do, but there are also lots of practical approaches that we can take to reduce the risk, to mitigate the risks that we've identified once we've identified them, once we understand fully what we do with the, with the data, and once we understand that it flows from the controller throughout the supply chain and back again. 
So that's my take on mitigating risks and how you can do that. The EU ATC GDPR um, and personal data and content for translation guide has got a little bit more around this and the questions that you can ask yourself, the types of activities that you can do in order to mitigate the risks around the type of processing that, that we do. It doesn't take away our obligation for GDPR compliance, but overall it plays into this accountability um, principle, transparency principle, data retention, or all of these elements that flow to us uh, from the GDPR requirements. We've got a couple of minutes. If anybody's got any pressing questions, we can take those before I give the floor over to Manuel um, to talk about another practical aspect, data anonymization, whether that can be a tool for us to um, mitigate risks for personal data in, in content for translation. I don't see any questions at the moment relating to your presentation. Uh, so we have a question, um, should we be deleting all old emails? Well, I would say to that, that that's one of the gray areas that we have, that we talk about files, folders, translation memories, and we forget that emails are uh, also data repositories. So all of our saved, and we like to save everything. I mean, John said that before, we're an industry, we like to save absolutely everything. And uh, there's no difference to emails. Emails in your Outlook folder or, or Gmail or whatever you use, they are uh, stored data. Um, they are a data repository. So the same principle applies there. And I would also go back to something that um, uh, Melina said earlier. If we, we only keep data for as long as we need to. So essentially, although even if you would like to keep all of those old old emails, and they sometimes do come in come in handy, if you really don't need them, why should you keep them? And here we, we've got, of course, in emails, we've got two different types of, of um, data. We've got the data that is still being sent as attachments, translated content as attachments from the client to you, perhaps even the other way around. So data and content for translation, but there's also data um, pertaining to your business activities. So your clients, uh, personal data, your suppliers, uh, personal data. So there is no difference to, uh, to, to that. And we have some follow-up questions uh, around emails, uh, Raisa. What is old and does email include unsolicited emails that you might receive? <laughs> well, what is old is like the uh, you know the British saying how how long is a piece of string? This is where we come to the data retention period, right? It needs to be um, appropriate to the you know processing activity. So we can't say it's six months, it's a year, it's five years, it's, it's ten years. Um, it needs to be commensurate with 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 your data retention policies. Unsolicited emails. Why would you keep them anyway is my answer to that. If the data is not there, there is no risk. So especially with unsolicited email from people whose personal data you've got no interest in keeping, why would you keep it? Um, if you don't have a reason, pressing reason to keep it, then if you delete it, you've got no problem. That's my uh, uh, practical take on, on that. But I am going to um, now share my screen with Manuel's um, presentation. And we give, give the floor over to Manuel. Hi. Yes, can you, can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Uh, good. Uh, I'm just using my new iPod. Um, so, Trusting the technology here. Uh, okay, so my role uh, within the community is to add the, the vision of a developer 
of anonymization solutions. Now, uh, before I, I, I delve more into the matter, I have to stress that anonymization is impossible, uh, cannot happen. Uh, we, we really need to talk about de-identification. Uh, if it is okay that we, we speak about anonymization and we all understand what it is, but uh, if you hear experts uh, talking about the subject, they know that full anonymization is impossible to, to achieve because there, there is always a risk within a text to have uh, world knowledge that would lead a, a, a paragraph of text uh, towards towards um, towards the identification of a of a person. So, um, I'm going to use the term anonymization because we all do, and we all, we all understand what uh, what what, uh, what needs to be de-identified. But essentially, anonymization uh, for us means the identification of personal data. Uh, and that is what software does. Uh, software is trained, as we shall see in, in a minute, uh, with neural networks, with rules, etc., so that uh, named entities, names, surnames, bank details, telephone numbers, emails, URLs, and sometimes next of kin, uh, are deleted, I are identified and then deleted. So uh, next slide, please, uh, Raisa. Okay. There are three um, three approaches to anonymization. Um, when we have an incoming text, um, typically this text contains personal data and we can apply three um, uh, three techniques in order to, to uh, de-identify the, the, the data that is contained therein. Uh, first one is anonymization with gaps, where we will use a line with placeholders, or we can use pseudonymization. It's pseudonymization, it's not pseudo-anonymization. Um, it, it is the use of, of synonyms. Uh, next slide, please, Bryson. With gaps, um, when we use anonymization with gaps, uh, our software will detect a number of items or entities within the text. So in this case, we are detecting uh, names, Sarah Palin, Trump Palin, Donald Trump, etc. We are also uh, detecting uh, locations, locations, and lead to the identification of the facts or, or, the, or the person. And we are identifying, we are also identifying um, dates, uh, such as Monday, the 26th, September, and so forth. So, um, anonymization with gaps is, 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 is straightforward. Uh, there is no information conveyed here. Um, the data is deleted and a, the same place is, is placed in, uh, in all cases. There is no identification as to whether we are de-identifying a name or a, or a date or a date or a, or, or a location. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that it really doesn't, we don't have to, we can forget about uh, gender issues, about quality volumes, uh, about adding any type of, of uh, tagging or further information into the process. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, placeholders is also very popular. Uh, it's a very popular um, approach. Uh, very similar to, to the previous one, where we, uh, again, we use um, a placeholder that we want to use. This can be a dollar sign, it can be an X, it can be a Euro sign, it can be a ZZ, etc. 
the disadvantage of these two methods, placeholders and gaps, is that they render the, the data quite unusual. Uh, you can't really do much with the data if you plan to either monetize it or share it in any way. However, these are two very good methods for people to de-identify the, the data is there. Um, I'm using the same example here and before, but you can you can imagine that for uh, applications in a in the in, in a in a medical environment uh, where we're dealing with patient data, it suffices and, and, and really more than more than suffices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, right here. I think that's it, pseudonymization. Pseudonymization. Yeah. yeah next slide, please. I, th I think that, can you not see it? Uh, no, my, my, my. Okay, let me just go back. Mind change. Okay, okay, yeah, pseudonymization, okay. Yeah, yeah. is that all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the, the, most, uh, the most exciting technique, um, in, in the identification slash anonymization is pseudonymization. Now, here's, uh, this is very interesting because we use, uh, and more challenging as a developer, because we use alternatives to the entities that are detected. So uh, in this case, Sarah, Sarah becomes John, uh, <clears throat> Track becomes Jane, uh, Donald Trump becomes somebody else and, and different places are used. The, the beauty of, of this method is that it aids reading. So, um, especially because the same names are used all the time. So if Sarah Palin, uh, Sarah Palin here is entity number one and we decide to use John, John Doe, we will use John Doe all the time, every time that Sarah Palin is, was mentioned. So. Uh, this is very good for uh, for material that comes out of uh, legal courts. Uh, it aids uh, reading and understanding uh, of the data. There are challenges, however, uh, there are challenges in, in some languages when you have to match uh, gender. The either is not is not happening in this case because a female is substituted by a name by a by a male name. Uh, it doesn't affect English so much, but it's critical in other languages where you can't simply use a male name for a, for a female. Uh, it, yes, it, it is more challenging for, uh, for a developer. Even so more because uh, we have uh, declensions and, and cases to take into, into account. Um, and uh, that is uh, even more challenging if you wish than machine translation. Uh, you need to detect the case. Uh, morphologically rich languages are the ones that score worse in, in this type of the uh, identification. However, um, we apply the technique uh, in order to get personal data uh, out uh, to, to lose all kind of traceability. So uh, it's a very wide, uh, it's a very wide, uh, widely used technique especially in the legal field. Uh, okay, next one, please. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, as translation professionals go, um, one question can be, okay, this is very good, but how does it work? Okay, there, there are a number of systems out there in, in, in the field uh, that you can search for commercial. Um, commercial systems, Pangeanic led a European project designed to develop a multilingual anonymized uh, de identification tool in all the official languages of the European Union. And that software is, is freely available. The, the code is in GitLab. You can go to the, to the project's website and, and download it. However, I have to say that that is a software designed, I have to stress this, it's designed for public administrations. It's, it's not designed for a, a simple Windows user or Mac user uh, at home. 
if you have sufficient uh, computer knowledge, you can probably put it uh, put it to work. But it's, it's designed really for for organizations, corporations. Um, commercial solutions uh, that I feel uh, around. We have one, uh, but I'm not here to promote ours. Um, and they, they can interface with popular translation tools such as Trados or MemoQ or Memsource, uh, etc. Um, there is always a, a, an issue here about where should the uh, anonymization software be located. It kind of, uh, and I understand this well, it kind of defeats the, the objects if we are sending data through the internet to a machine that is located in, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany. Uh, for it to anonymize or delete personal data and then send the data back. Um, I see that point. However, uh, communications nowadays are very well secured, uh, internet communications, point to point. Um, and what you are sending uh, most of the time is a segment after a segment. You're never sending uh, a full document. Uh, communication happens as snippets of text. So even if uh, there was an interception in between the communication between the user and the got to provider or, or the company, the most that uh, that hacker could get would be a series of strings uh, and, and likely strings that are already uh, anonymized, not, not uh, full documents. Um, okay, next slide, please, Rice. Good. So let's let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, Mapa is the projects uh, that I mentioned, uh, multilingual anonymization, and um, and uh, I think we can visit the the website. Uh, everybody should be near a computer or a, or a phone uh, here so that uh, please go to the next slide Raisa and I would um, encourage you to have a play uh, with it very shortly I'll, I'll mention what the aims were um, develop the toolkit so it can be applied by public administrations this is in use already as the Spanish Ministry of Justice is in use by the European Ombudsman uh, the people that are at a national level and a European level receive uh, user complaints like well my telephone provider has charged me this electricity bill is outrageous uh, there's a mistake in my whatever um it addresses all 24 european languages from english even to Maltese and irish um it's based on uh, has been developed on neural networks i have to say that it also has a specialism in the use cases that were part of the project. So yes, there are different levels of accuracy um, in, in some languages, but uh, it works very well as a black box uh, where you can have two, two outputs, one multilingual and one proper to, to your language. So uh, next slide, and I think we'll go to the, um, okay, we'll go to, uh, uh, the way that we annotated data, there was a massive effort in annotation. Uh, we gathered data containing personal name addresses, a number of entities in many languages, this is Bulgarian, uh, a large a chunk, um, um, a large section of the project was devoted to manually uh, annotating data, so identifying names, uh, persons, dates, etc. I think there is, this is Bulgarian and there is a Croatian example in the next page, please, yeah. Uh, Romanian, yeah. Um, and this was done month after month after month and uh, training after retraining of each little network until, uh, next slide, please, until we got here. So uh, I'd like everybody to, uh, if possible, to go to the to the project uh, website, uh, mapa slash project.eu. You'll see a demo page there. Uh, I'm not sure if I can share my screen. Grace, can I? 
Yes, you should be able to. I've stopped sharing now. Okay. Good. So let's uh, let's go to my panel. Uh, and I encourage you to use it uh, online um, uh, just to try it and see how uh, animation works uh, in real life. So uh, here at the top, we have uh, the number of, of entities that we have worked in, um, in identifying in text texts coming from 24 languages. Um, I'm going to write something here. Well, I work. And this is my visiting okay so i have a um several options here i can either detect or obfuscate the, the entities if i detect i only run detection and you can see the guts of the beast if you, if you wish uh, and how it works if i tr choose to obfuscate i will simply uh, i will simply delete uh, the personal the uh, details uh, to comply with GDPR. If I choose to detect, there will be no deletion. Uh, there will be simply a, an identification. Uh, now, this is running on a multilingual engine. And there are other engines uh, that have been developed for, for use cases. So, uh, I know this is English. Um, so, let's try English and run it again. Um, this, this has worked better, but it hasn't been the United Nations. Um, so here are the, the this, this is MAPA. Um, there is no one technique uh, for everything. Uh, usually when when uh, the Ministry of Justice or the, or the Ombudsman uh, are working, um, they choose a number of engines so one uh, one benefits from from the other uh, let me, let's, uh, let's, i'm going to use text coming from a different side uh, if it contains if it contains personal data So here yeah, you can see how, how the neural network is detecting entities. Or well, then again, I just we can choose just to obfuscate and simply delete them. Um, so that it offers map offers a high level of accuracy. Um, however, it is a, it is a basic uh, system. Any anybody willing to deploy MAPA will require a certain knowledge of, of, of computing and adaptation to, to the circumstances. And really, in a nutshell, uh, Raisa, this is, this is it. Uh, has, ever, has everybody got the, the, web, the web address to play with MAPA? I've, I've shared it through the chat now. Um, okay. And I'm sure we'll have questions, but I'm going to um, use my prerogative because I can unmute myself and ask the first question. <laughs> one word. So um, in terms of using different types of anonymization tools, is it right to say that there's quite a lot of challenges in, in trying to use those tools pre translation because of the different you know complexities around language that you can't actually produce an accurate translation if you take out personal data with certain types of documents so would you see the anonymization tools more useful in terms of of 
treating translation memory content, for example, so clearing uh, TM content, perhaps even our old legacy TM content mm -hmm. from personal mm -hmm. data and making it safer that way. Yeah, yeah, I understand. No, uh, it, it can run uh, both ways. It can run MAPA at least, and, and most and, um, animation tools or the identification tools, they know it run both in, in uh, offline mode and online mode. Uh, as MAPA, as you've seen, it is very fast. Um, it works on CPU, it's traditional, it's traditional computer. You don't need uh, GPUs like you do for uh, machine translation. So you can run it live, absolutely. Uh, you can run it live even for, a, for a, an organization. Or you can also use it to cleanse uh, all data, as, as you said, on, offline, it's pumping TMX material or document. Yeah. Yeah, but if you if you do it if you do it on uh, content for translation before it's been translated, then that may mm -hmm. hamper you know obviously the, the the output of the translation because if you don't translate Germany, then that, that that's that's an issue or you can't even reproduce that's true. that. That's, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, the, the question here always is uh, you know how much knowledge does the does the uh, translator need to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, if you don't translate generally because you, all you see is some asterisks, you uh, that word will be substituted, and, and yeah. Germany will yeah. will be uh, will be replaced as such with serialization, and it will be Alemán or Alemania, yeah. or any, anything yeah. like that. Um, however, uh, the uses that I see, or, or at least our clients that are using uh, 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 our our animation solutions use it to share data. So it's, they apply it after translation, mm -hmm. not to keep not to keep the translator out of the loop, mm. the trusted translator. Okay, um, and sometimes or uh, there is translation, and okay, German is missing, uh, the, the country name is missing, the, the street is missing, so it's missing. Mm. Uh, we, we yeah, know. We, we translate around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll take, a, there's a couple of questions coming through, but I'll ask one MAPA related question before we take those. Um, MAPA we've seen online and you've said that, you know, if you want to apply it, if you want to take it into, into your daily use and, and, and use it as a tool, mm -hmm. you do require technical expertise to do that. Do you see um, commercial off the shelf products coming through that? Mm -hmm. deploy MAPA technology so that we could buy a tool that does what MAPA does to clean yeah. up legacy data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have we have one, but I'm, I'm not here to promote yeah. our technology. Yeah. Yeah. I know of other companies in Spain as well, in, in the north of Spain, and there are other companies. Uh, well, MAPA is based on text. It doesn't yeah. handle images. We have to yeah. we have to clear that. Uh, but I do see, I do know of other 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 technologies that um, uh, only focus on, on image, for example, on face recognition yeah. or car, car number plates. And they're very successful and they sell that to people that run car parks because the car park needs to take a picture of your, of your car coming in for insurance yeah. purposes. And that has to be deleted or anonymized, et cetera. Yeah. Or, uh, the, the person getting in or out of the car and was the number plate, so you automatically the, 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 bar, the barrier lifts when yeah. you leave. Um, so there, there are a number of applications. The, the last frontier where we uh, do research is multi multimodal anonymization. So that's taking into account speech, uh, image, and text. Uh, in other words, video as well. Yeah. Wow. Okay. It's, that, that's in the pipeline. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's take our questions. So starting with with Ruth. Um, how well does it currently work with mixed quality data? So social media postings with shorthand or spelling issues? Spelling doesn't matter. It is, spelling doesn't matter. The, the, um, the neural network is not, is not trying to understand what it's saying. In fact, you could put garbage, complete garbage. You could mix languages using the multilingual model. Uh, one sentence in Portuguese, the next sentence in Italian or Romanian, and, and MAPA would detect the language and apply it. Yeah. Uh, it detects entities based on how 
sure it is that something is a place, a telephone number or, or, or a person. Yeah, okay. Claudia is asking at which, which stage of the process are translations of obf obfuscated months or weekdays inserted? How do you deal with date formats or name suffixes to be localized? Is the short answer you don't because MAPA identifies them and then it takes them out. So you can't restore them. Yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah, MAPA doesn't pseudonymize. Obfuscate is it's a one way. It's, uh, MAPA is uh, multilingual anonymization. Yep. Public administrations. And it's not multilingual pseudonymization. Yeah, and it can't be. So if we talk about anonymization, it cannot be reversed. So that is permanent. Right. Once the data is gone, the data is gone. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Pseudo, yep. pseudo, uh, pseudo, pseudo, if you use pseudonyms, then uh, that is reversible. That is not yep. anonymization, it's pseudonymization. Yeah. Carol which, which, asking, it, yeah. Which, which helps you comply with the law. Um, the law for uh, what GDPR says is that anonymization has to be irreversible for it to happen. If 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 it's reversible, then it's not anonymized. It's something else. It's, yeah. they, you're dealing with it for very good reasons because you, you need to go back to the data, but it's, it's not. It's it's, it's yeah. Then see you then. Yeah, Carlos um, uh, saying. Um, why would a country name be protected by the GDPR if no connection to a name is possible? It wouldn't. It wouldn't unless because, you. Can... Yeah, because the speaker in today's conference is lives in Spain, and therefore you can guess only by the country where I reside who I am. It's a place. This it's is. A place. This place. is. This is this is one of the gray areas that we've talked about in, in uh, within our working group. Um, what is personal data? What data do you mm. need for to exactly. make it personal data? And this is a challenge for mm. for us. It doesn't necessarily need to be your personal personal details, your address, your health data, whatever. If you can be identified from it, exactly. then it's personal data. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Let's let's take another example that uh, I, I used to that. The son of the mayor of London. There are no names there, mm. but I've just revealed who I, who I'm talking about. Yeah. So one of the things that Mapa does, I can remember, yeah, Mapa does as well. I was for sure, is to also detect uh, jobs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If there is a translator in the room, and everybody here is military, well, I, I know. I know who I'm talking. Is the translator, so I only need to find out who's it. Yeah. So uh, professions need to be deleted. Uh, next of kin needs, needs to be deleted as well. Interesting. Gabriela is saying or asking, what do you think of Trados TM anonymizer? I haven't tried it. I I've heard good things about it, uh, but it, I use, um, I've never used it. Uh, I, I've heard that it works well. Okay. So, anonymization is a method that we can use to mitigate risk. You've said it yourself. We'll come back to it later on um, with our legal experts to talk a little bit more about is that enough or not? You've said it can never be 100%, very few measures can and this is what we talked about at our working group meetings as as well that no it company is ever going to promise you 100 uh, percent data security um this kind of falls into that category as well but it is mm -hmm. clearly a really you know these kinds of technologies are really um great ways of, of mitigating of reducing that risk used correctly. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Even a, a uh, uh, an off-the-shelf system that, it ha that hasn't been customized will probably, probably run at uh, accuracy level, uh, we call it F1, F1 recall level in excess of 92, 95, 96%. Is it perfect? No. Can you miss Raisa's name, Manuel? Yes. But 
that will be the one time in in that will be the one time in in a hundred. Uh, it's a great, 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 great help. But you know, I'm sorry to say that computers crash sometimes. You know, an email fails too. Mm. Um, uh, but however, it's it's one onion skin that you know, it's, yeah. it's another layer of protection that we yeah. Uh, we... Fabulous. Thank you, Manuel. Shall we go to lunch, John? Yes, yes. Thank you, Manuel, for your presentation. Yes. So we, according to the program, we'll be back in half an hour from now uh, for our next panel discussion with the legal experts and the, the really hot topics of can we keep our translation data, translation yeah. memory, these retention periods and other pain points, these grey areas that we've been talking about so we to discuss all of those with the, the legal experts on our expert group. So... Everyone, enjoy your lunch and I'll see you again in half an hour. All right, thank you.
So <clears throat> good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone. Do we have all our panelists here? I'm here. Yes, I am also here. I have some problem with camera. I, I don't know what um, what to do because I don't want to connect. Okay, but we can hear you, so. Okay, so what can I do? Uh, because it's somehow inactive uh, out of the blue because it was working earlier. Yeah, it was fine before, but um, okay, it's yes. not working now. Well, we can proceed even without the camera, I think. It's, okay, okay. It's major I'm issue. afraid to leave and uh, join again um, because I don't know if it will work. Mm. <clears throat> and is Pavel back yet or? Yes. Okay, so welcome back everyone uh, for this uh, second panel discussion of the day. Um, Raisa is going to be leading this panel and we're going to be looking at the, the very hot topic of how we can keep our translation data, translation memories and other pain points, so unclear issues in the, the GDPR and how these affect the translation and interpreting sector. So over to you, Raisa. Thank you, John. And hi again, everyone. Hope you had a good break. Um, before we start with the session, we wanted to share with you greetings from Kyiv. Um, lock lunch is going on at this very moment. Um, our colleagues in Kyiv are still continuing to work despite everything. Um, and they have put together a lock lunch event remotely, of, of course. And um, we wanted to show our support. So although we can't join them um, today and we're too many to, to do that, um, we wanted to just acknowledge and send our best wishes, our regards, our support um, to them having lock lunch online in Kyiv at the moment and also to share a recent multilingual magazine interview with the lady who um, has organized Lock Lunch today, um, Maria Malikina, who is um, a manager at a Ukrainian LSP Technolex translation studio, talking about her experiences in, in continuing to work and, and life in uh, Ukraine. So we just wanted to pause, pause here and um, send our support, send our thoughts over to our colleagues there. And of course, we'll support them in any whichever way we can. Um, but our program today moves on. And like John said, we are now going to move over to the um, big question of data retention, can I keep my translation data, translation memories, and, um, and those tricky questions that we've already mentioned. But I'm just going to um, swap over to my specialist presentation. There we go. So the question is, can we keep our translation data? What are the pain points? What are the challenges that lie ahead? And we wanted to do this session um, partly from the point of view of the, of the practitioners, of us trying to find the right way of um, applying, implementing, complying with the GDPR, and then the legal aspect. So um, our panelists are all here, but um, we'll ask Margorzata and Pavel and Melina to take the floor again as the legal experts and open up some of the legal complexities around data retention. So I wanted to ask uh, Margorzata, who's, um, whose camera is not working at the moment, but she's there to start yes, with it's us. Okay. It's okay, um, now. okay, great. Um, on the key principles of the GDPR. Yes, yeah, so first of all, uh, we um, need to stress that the um, key point in our discussion should be uh, this uh, regulation of Article 28, uh, um, 3.G, 
uh, that our agreement, because when it, when it comes to uh, the data that we are processing on behalf of uh, our client, yes, because uh, th these are data contained in, in this uh, translated content. Uh, so um, the agreement should stipulate that at the choice of the controller, uh, we have to delete or return all the personal data to the controller after the end of the provision of services. So it means that when we fulfill our obligations from the agreement, um, agreement of um, providing services, uh, translation services, it means that we have to wait for the decision of controller. And controller um, determines if we should delete this um, data or return. Um, there are no further uh, options. So there, there's no option that we can keep it on behalf of the controller because it, it means that we have another agreement for another um, purpose of uh, processing on behalf of uh, controller. So uh, I've heard that uh, there are some um, situations in which contracts between um, controller and processor um, encompass such a provision that a processor can keep the data, personal data, for purpose of uh, archiving, for example, for six years, three years. So um, I, um, in my mind, um, and as I understand uh, the obligations uh, arising out of uh, <clears throat> GDPR, it is mm, very dubi dubious and uh, it is still convention of uh, GDPR regulations because it means that um, in such a case uh, we process the data because storage is also processing <clears throat> and it is obvious um, in the light of the definition of um, data processing uh, so it means that uh, <clears throat> we process uh, the data um, on our own purposes because archiving means that we archive it and can uh, take it whenever we want, yes? Because it's our uh, obligation. And, uh, it means that we are uh, here as a controller. So um, even if we have in our agreement such a provision, it uh, doesn't allow us uh, to, um, to avoid um, regulations which uh, concern to um, controller, because in fact we are controllers. Uh, so the, the, the question is, uh, if we uh, finished our um, translating service, if yes, um, it means that we keep the data just until the decision of controller. Then we or delete or, um, or uh, return. Uh, the data. Uh, I mean, if we anonymize, uh, 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 anonymize the data and keep only uh, the rest of the text translated, it's okay. Uh, we are um, here uh, pointing only the uh, personal data. So um, GDPR um, is irrelevant when it comes to other um, content. Uh, <clears throat> And if we want to archive uh, this um, uh, translation uh, with uh, the data um, for our own purposes, it means that we are controllers. So we have to um, uh, fulfill all the regulations uh, which are uh, distinct, uh, distinct uh, for the controllers. So um, we have to... Um, uh, we have to do all the things that uh, are stipulated in the GDPR uh, as to controllers. Um, and we have to um, facilitate um, the possibility of um, exercising the rights uh, through, uh, by the, um, sub the data subjects. And sometimes we even don't know the data subjects, yes, because if translated uh, content um, contain the um, uh, personal data of third parts, which we don't have any um, relation with, it would be very difficult or even impossible to, to um, fulfill the obligations from GDPR. So the only, uh, reason, uh, the only way to um, uh, 
uh, to avoid uh, the um, responsibilities and liability from uh, from the GDPR is to anonymize our translation memoirs. So that is <clears throat> the main uh, the main conclusion um, which uh, which we can draw uh, on in the light of GDPR. But I've heard uh, some uh, um, some uh, trials to distinguish between passive storage and active storage yes and uh, i have to stress that it is very interesting concept uh, concept but there is no um very vivid and uh, clear base uh, legal base for this basis uh, for this in the gdpr so maybe it will evolve uh, the interpretation of uh, uh, gdpr uh, provisions and regulations in that way and it could be interesting and, and very helpful for your profession. But um, now I don't see very um, good ground for it uh, in, uh, in GDPR. Okay, thank you, Margot Shatan. We'll come back to this, um, this, this question. And of course, everything that we've talked about today derives from you know, the basic principles of, of the GDPR. And, and we've talked about it before, transparency accountability but there are also others that that we've mentioned briefly today and and they have got very much to do with data retention so purpose limitation you only store it store the data for a defined period and for an agreed purpose and that purpose is agreed with the controller and there's the principle of storage limitation so you only store it for the agreed time and then there's the principle of, of data minimization. So you only store the necessary data. And of course, we know that, you know, our legal experts are very clear on this, but we know that the current approach of our sector clashes with, with all of this, because what we do do at the moment is that we do store and we do archive all possible documents and, and data often for an indefinite period of time because we think that they might be useful in the future or because they're genuinely useful. And we store translations in translation memories indefinitely and we reuse them at will because TMs are our core business um, assets. And this is a, a real problem for our sector and this is the problem that you know, we haven't properly addressed but that we're addressing now and discussing now as part of this this project. We have heard already from our legal uh, experts, from um, you know, the data protection supervisor, that the GDPR doesn't make exceptions for our, our sector. We're not special. I mean, we are special, of course, but we're not special from the point of view of GDPR compliance. And I think it's becoming very clear to us now that keeping data indefinitely just in case or for some purpose is not okay and the GDPR does not allow that. So then that leads us to questions of how long are we allowed to keep data? Who should define data retention periods is a question that we've already had here. Another question that we've had today is, is what about liability or the requirement to retain certain data for legal purposes or for future updates? or for client complaints or payment issues, or in Poland where there is a legal requirement for certified translations to keep translations for a certain period of, of time. Um, we've got a couple of comments. I think Pavel has commented. Is that, Pavel, a, a response to a question or do you want to come in and um, comment at this point before we move on to talking about data retention specifically? No, no, it's an answer to a question. Okay. Uh, so. Great. So maybe we can take that. You can take that later then um, in your section. But I want to invite Melina to join us now to talk about data retention and hopefully give us um, some answers as to how long can we keep data and what can we keep data for. Thank you, Reza. I already mentioned that earlier uh, when I was talking about our main obligations under the GDPR when we are controllers. In the case where we are controllers, we uh, must do 
what the GDPR says, and that is um, comply with the purpose of, with the storage limitation principle. That principle that obliges us to delete or destroy any data uh, from the moment that this data is no longer necessary for the purpose for which it was initially collected. There might be some uh, national legislation on specific data sets that we may process, uh, in which legislation could provide that uh, we must, as a legal obligation, uh, keep some kind of data for uh, a specific period of time. I earlier talked about uh, an example we have in Greece for uh, tax data that we are uh, obliged to keep to retain for uh, 10 years. Where no such legislation exists, then uh, we should follow the storage limitation principle and keep the data only for as long as it is necessary for the purposes of for which they were they, it was in, collected in the first place. We uh, that uh, but all these concerns only the, the processing we undergo as data controllers and um, this is when we are talking about administrative client data or supplier data or uh, employee data perhaps. Um, we usually advise that we could keep some more data for a longer period of time um, when uh, we want to have uh, the data for the purpose of um, exercising relevant legal claims. <clears throat> for as long as the law provides for us uh, the, the right to exercise some uh, legal claims or that um, the law provides that someone else might exercise such a claim against us, we could uh, retain some of the data uh, so that we would be able to address those claims. But in that case, we should always keep in mind that we should keep only the data that are relevant and necessary for those claims. That means that <clears throat> we might uh, not uh, we may not keep the for example the translated text itself but we could uh, have a, uh, for example our client sign us um, a receipt of the of the text of the translated text or uh, that he that he uh, obtained and uh, received the text and that it is fine for, from him so such a receipt would um, uh, certainly be useful in the case that this client at a later stage decides to exercise a, a legal claim against us. Um, in the case where there is no other way to uh, exercise or to um, support such, such a claim, such a legal claim, and uh, we absolutely need to keep the, the translated text, then we should um, still try to minimize the data in it and delete any data or anonymizing data that uh, is in the text and that is not relevant to the purpose of this specific processing, which will be um, defending our uh, legal claims. When we are processors, um, we are not to um, decide on the, on the data retention periods. Um, as my Rada said, this is the controller. Uh, it is the controller who has to decide on that. And we, as a processor uh, that are processing on behalf of the, of the controller, uh, have to obey, have to comply with the controller's um, documented um, guides, uh, gui gui guidance. So, <clears throat> Um, as far as uh, data in translation memories, uh, I don't think if you want me to refer to that now or later. No, we'll come back to that that later. Um, but are you now saying, Melina, that if we talk about personal data and content for translation, of course, we agree that, you know, retention periods, how long that data is kept are defined by the controller. But if we have a conflict between uh, a data retention period set by the controller 
and a legal obligation to, uh, for example, buy a certified translator to retain translations for a certain period of time, i.e. union law versus member state law, which takes precedence? Uh, it's uh, absolutely certain that uh, the legal obligation prevails any, any contracting or any agreement or any um, uh, request from the controller. Yeah, so that's, that's our answer to the especially certified translations, uh, translators um, out there, that if there is a legal obligation to retain the data, then that overrides the contractual agreement with the, with the data controller. But I suppose, of course, good business practice would mean that the data controller is informed of the fact so that they're even aware that this, you know, that the data is retained for longer than in any contractual agreement. Article 28 <clears throat> provides for that and says that uh, when the processor uh, is not able to comply with a certain obligation of the contract agreement of the data processing agreement, uh, he should notify the controller about this legal obligation that uh, uh, makes him <clears throat> uh, not, does not uh, leave him any choice, but not to comply with a certain clause of the, of the agreement. So okay. yes, we should not find the controller on that. Yeah, great. Thank you, Melena. So we've talked about data retention period, and we've said before that there is not one period. There's not six months, one year, three years, five years, ten years. It is defined by the data controller, and or by member state law or other um, legal obligations. But it is um, the controller who owns the data, so to speak. So if the controller requires for the data to be deleted or returned, uh, we must do that all throughout the supply chain again, unless there is a specific legal reason that we cannot do that. One of the other key areas that we talked about within our working group is um, defining data retention period based on uh, the period for the provision of services, of translation services, because um, there are often client queries or there might be um, a, a complaint or updates or whatever. So one of the areas that we're also looking at is can we, should we define what is a period of provision of services? Does it end when the translation is returned to the client? Is that the end of the data retention period potentially? Or does that go into once the client has accepted the translation, um, once they have perhaps paid for the translation and so on? There are no clear answers to that. So we're not going to tell you today what, what those answers are. But these are some of the gray areas still existing in terms of talking about provision of services. When does that end for the kinds of assignments that, that we, we do? Okay, let's then move on to talking about translation memories, TMs. We've said that the GDPR won't make exceptions for our, our sector, but we know that translation memories are absolutely some of our most critical assets. And also we know that we have huge legacy TMs, so huge repositories of legacy data from before GDPR full of Actually, we don't know what they are full of because often there's years of accumulated um, data in there. So I'm going to um, ask Margot Jata to come back now um, and talk a little bit about the big problem with our, our TMs and for us to get a clear answer on can we retain data in translation memories. Sorry, you're muted, Magojata. You're muted. Sorry, I forgot. Um, so as I previously said, and I mm, will stick to it, mm, uh, after the end of the provision of services, <clears throat> it is our own risk. Uh, so we keep the data uh, on our own risk because we are the controllers. Uh, any purpose exceeding the... Mm, mm, primary purpose, uh, which were defined by the um, uh, controller, is a new purpose for um, processing. And it means that we have to have legal ground for that, 
for, for it. Uh, so uh, if you have any legal grant, uh, this legal grant can be a um, regulation of union or member state, as we uh, already previously stated. Uh, but if you have no such regulations, uh, it means that you have to um, go back to Article 6, find a legal basis for, um, uh, for keeping the data, and then you turn into controller. So it means that you bear all consequences for um, um, facilitating uh, exercising of the rights of data subjects. And this is the main problem, because if you don't know them and you don't know any, um, no, um, uh, you, you have no connection with them, how you can um, facilitate it and how can you uh, fulfill uh, obligations as a controller? Uh, in that case, it, mean that you, uh, it means that you uh, keep the data on your own risk. Uh, in fact, it is... Uh, the risk is not very um, uh, not very grave, not grave, yes, because if you keep it uh, like a so-called passive um, uh, processing, yes, passive storage, uh, probably it won't leak, it won't uh, be, um, uh, you know, the, the, the subject of any um, uh, inqui uh, inquiry uh, from the state, um, uh, state uh, institutions, but the risk uh, exists, yes? So uh, you have to uh, bear in mind that as a controller, you don't, uh, you didn't do um, all, uh, all the obligation uh, which are um, imposed on you uh, by GDPR. So if you bear it in mind and you, you know, agree <laughs> to, to bear the risk because your um, advantages are greater, um, so, okay, but you have to uh, be uh, conscious uh, that you are the controller in that case. Uh, you are not longer do it on behalf of the processor. Great, thank you, Margot Shata. So this is, this is the crux now of this gray, gray area that we're coming to, that essentially what we have found out through the scope of this project is that when we transfer data, onto translation memories, we're starting to process data, use data for our own purposes, not the controller's purposes. So we're talking about this, um, this question of when do we turn from processors into controllers, do we? And what happens when we do? Um, and for opening up some of the further considerations and also some of the guidance that is starting to come out from national data protection authorities. Pavel will um, join us now to talk us through those. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, Raisa. Um, so um, what I'm about to say is uh, perhaps not very new. It has been already, this is, it has already been said numerous times in this very workshop, uh, but uh, I, I guess some things, there is just never enough uh, of repetition concerning some such, such, such things. So uh, just to make sure that we are all on the same page with the controller processor distinction, let me uh, simply tell you once again that the, 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 the controller is the one who determines purposes and at least the essential means of processing is the controller who is responsible uh, for GDPR compliance and who should be able to demonst demonstrate <clears throat> GDPR compliance according to the principle of uh, accountability. And the processor uh, is the controller subcontractor in a way it's, it's uh, a person or entity who processes data on behalf and on instructions from the controller. Um, however, if there is a change of purpose, there is a new processing and there can be a new controller. Uh, so the, the attribution of uh, data processing roles and responsibilities starts again with, with a new processing and, and the new purpose means there is a new processing. Um, operation. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so uh, the client 
as we said, we, we imagine that the client is the controller for the processing of any documents that he provides for the purpose of obtaining um, the translation. However, the, um, the, uh, the LSP, the, the, the translator, the translation company, uh, can become controller when it reuses the data for a different purpose, uh, like feeding translation memories. Um, um, okay, can we move on to the next slide? <clears throat> so, uh, if you are a translator and your client, the controller, entrusts you with um, some documents about to be translated with some personal data, uh, your role is to process uh, the document on behalf and uh, under the instructions of uh, the controller. However, if you decide unilaterally to reuse the data for a different purpose, like, for example, including uh, some pieces of this document in the translation memory, uh, you actually infringe the GDPR and uh, you are to be considered uh, as a controller for the new processing. Uh, so unauthorized reuse of data by a processor for a new purpose, for the processor's own purpose, normally exposes the processor to penalties uh, contractual liability, for example, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the controller for not respecting his inst instructions. And uh, in addition to this, uh, the, um, the uh, processor becomes now the controller for the processing. So he becomes liable, uh, responsible for GDPR compliance for this new processing and so can be uh, um, uh, can be exposed to sanctions for uh, not respecting uh, the GDPR. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? <clears throat> now, um, the key question here is, is it possible for a processor to lawfully reuse the data um, uh, for uh, his or her own purpose, the data um, uh, uh, provided by uh, the controller. Uh, the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, uh, has issued very interesting guidance on this uh, very subject recently in, in, in January. Um, and uh, let me be clear, this guidance formally only applies in France, although the CNIL is uh, a very influential data protection authority. It's historically the first data protection authority, the oldest one, created in 1978. Um, and um, it is not impossible that this guidance will also influence other um, uh, national data protection authorities from, from different countries. So it is worth um, listening to what the CNIL has to say on, on this question for anyone. <clears throat> so, uh, according to the CNIL, the, the controller, that is the client, can authorize uh, the processor to reuse the data for its own purposes under a set of conditions. First of all, first of all the reuse of the data has to be for a compatible purpose. So the purpose of reuse, the purpose for which the data are reused by the processor has to be compatible with the initial purpose. And this assessment of compatibility is the responsibility of the client. So it's up to the client to decide because he is the controller, uh, he can authorize reuse, or he can issue an instruction that uh, 
authorizes uh, reuse, so it is his responsibility. Um, <clears throat> so in assessing whether the new purpose, so for example, feeding the data to a translation memory is compatible with the initial purpose that is translating a document, um, the client should take uh, such elements into account as to take into account such elements as, uh, for example, the nature of the data. So if uh, the, the document contains uh, particularly sensitive data, like health data, for example, uh, then uh, this test will probably be uh, in, against uh, compatibility. That is, uh, the, 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 the client should probably not authorize the reuse. However, if the data are not of particularly sensitive nature, this may weigh in favor uh, of reuse. And another element that should be taken into account by the client in deciding whether he authorizes uh, the reuse or not are the, the safeguards uh, applied by uh, the processor, such as the security measures that he uh, the, the, the processor puts in place, or the anonymization of the data, pseudonymization of the data. Uh, these are all uh, safeguards for uh, the interests of the data subjects that should be taken into account in deciding whether the uh, reuse of data, for example, in translation memories should be authorized by the client uh, or not. The authorization should be specific. So for a specific purpose and not general, you can reuse the data for whatever purpose you want. It has to be specifically limited to, uh, to a well-defined, clearly defined purpose. Um, the authorization uh, should be given in writing because the contract it's as if it was part of the data processing agreement that should be in writing. Uh, so uh, it, the, this authorization should also be in writing. And the data subjects, that is the individuals that are concerned by the data in the document, uh, should be informed uh, about the new processing. And this is again, the client's responsibility. This is the controller's responsibility to inform the data subjects that um, he or she has authorized the reuse of the data for this particular purpose by a processor. This is the client's responsibility, but the task itself of actually informing uh, the concerned individuals uh, can be delegated to the LSP. Um, um, still, for this new processing, so this part only shields the, the uh, pro processor, the LSP, from uh, liability for GDPR infringement. But still, uh, for this new processing, uh, the LSP becomes the controller and so becomes responsible for GDPR compliance, which means that he has to define a legal basis define the data retention periods, uh, define the security measures that we put in place, um, etc. And so this is it uh, from me and from the French Data Protection Authority uh, concerning the reuse of the data by uh, the LSP by, or by any processor for that matter. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Um... Yes, so basically you can, but there is a major problem here for our industry, and, and that is primarily informing the data subjects whom we don't often know, have no access to, no conceivable way of, of informing about anything. And of course, we often know that probably our clients haven't informed them either of the, of the processing that their data is about to undergo in translation. So there are several layers of complexities around there. So we've got a few um, really interesting questions there. So we'll take those um, in just a moment, but we'll quickly talk through the ways of mitigating these risks um, that we've already looked at. Anonymization, pseudonymization, we have found are really powerful ways of um, removing 
or changing personal data in, in content. But we've said that that also counts as processing is seldom, if ever 100% accurate. We need to do those kinds of activities before the agreed data retention period is, is, is open. We need to figure out um, what is the appropriate agreement. So what is the definition of the scope of services with your client? What is the definition of the end of services? Um, do we have an authorization? Can we get an authorization to use personal data for the purposes of the LSP? What are those, those purposes? Okay. We wanted to say a few more words about uh, sub-processors, although we've talked about them a little bit, so maybe we will um, Pavel, um, go through this quite quickly so that we can take our, our um, questions as well. What do we need to take into account with sub-processors in terms of uh, data retention? Yes, well, I'll be as quick as, as uh, I can. So the, pro the processor can hire a sub-processor only if uh, it is authorized by the controller. The authorization can be uh, general or specific, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really, uh, it's not a huge difference because still uh, in a way the, the controller has to agree to every particular sub-processor individually cannot agree to a group of subprocessors, a, a category of subprocessors, if you, if you will. Um, um, so when, as a processor, you hire a subprocessor. So for example, as an LSP, you hire uh, a freelance translator to perform the translation task. Uh, you are supposed to enter uh, into a contract with the subprocessor, and this contract should reflect the clauses of uh, the data processing agreement. So, uh, so the, the agreement between the controller and the processor, uh, so that uh, is the, the subprocessor is de facto covered by the same uh, sorts of uh, obligations that concern the, the, the processor. It's really a prolongation, if you will, uh, an extension of of the processor from the legal point of view. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, so if there are sub processors in the chain, the controller remains in charge of the processing. He still defines uh, the, the purposes, the retention periods, uh, and his instructions still uh, have to be uh, respected and followed. Um, and the, the processor remains fully liable vis-a-vis -vis the controller for the performance of its tasks. So um, um, the controller is as if the, the I'm sorry, it is, it is as if the processor was still uh, liable for the work of his subcontractors, of his subprocessors. So from the point of view of the controller, the processor, so from the point of view of the client, the, the LSP remains the contact point uh, for any GDPR uh, related issues. Um, so adding a sub processor to the chain doesn't really change that much when it comes to uh, responsibilities. It's still the, the controller who's responsible. It adds, uh, arguably, it adds some responsibility uh, to the processor, because uh, he is now responsible not only for his own work, but also for the work of the uh, sub-processor. Uh, uh, can a sub-processor reuse the data uh, for its own purpose? Well, the answer is uh, no, uh, unless perhaps the same set of uh, uh, requirements as in the case of the processor is fulfilled. If the sub-processor receives an authorization from the controller to do so in, in the same conditions as listed by the CNIL. And then of course the sub-processor uh, would become uh, the controller for, for the processing. But since the sub-processor is removed a step further from the controller, I think uh, the, the, the possibility for him 
receiving an authorization is even more theoretical and, 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 and scholarly, uh, so to say, than um, uh, in the case of, of the controller uh, himself. So I think that the hypothesis of a sub-processor lawfully reusing data for its own purpose is, is a rather theoretical one. Uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Pavel. Question. Let's, um, let's take a couple of questions then before we, we wrap up. Um, there is a question on audits, um, so of transparency throughout the supply chain. It is becoming a common practice for agencies to state in their terms and conditions things like the company reserves the right to conduct audits of freelancers, facilities, PCs, etc. I suppose that according to GDPR, we can refuse any relevant audits, although we have signed such agreements. silence from our experts. Can you refuse audits? I, I don't think you can if it's on GDPR compliance because there has to be um, a trail. I, for example, I could uh, just read you out Article 28, Paragraph 3, 8.8, uh, that processor is obliged to make available to the controller all information necessary to demonstrate compliance with the obligations laid down in this article and allow for and contribute to audits, including inspections conducted by the controller or another auditor mandated by the controller. So the answer is clearly no, we cannot refuse any relevant audits. Great, thank you. Okay, further, um, I think maybe one question. Sorry, John, we're eating into your time. Um, let me just have a oh, quick That's okay, look. I'm probably okay with less than 10 minutes and how to wrap up. So take another five minutes or so for questions. Uh, Francesca is asking, I understand that if I store in my TEM, say the source and target text of the contract I've translated by eliminating from such texts any personal data, would the reuse of the remaining text still be considered a violation without the controller's consent? So if personal data has been removed, can I put it in my TEM? Take that later. I think that the answer is very clear here. Yes, as long as the text does not contain any personal data, and that is any information uh, that has any link to an identified or identifiable natural person, then there is no processing of personal data. And yes, we can uh, hold on and retain those texts. But that is not the case where even a slight a piece of information remains that could turn the, the data subject into uh, the natural perso person into an identifiable. If we can identify the natural person from uh, some information that remains to the text, then uh, we cannot speak about <clears throat> anonymization and we cannot exclude this processing from the GDPR and we cannot uh, exclude the turning of the processor into a controller. So the answer is, if we are non fully anonymized, irre irreversibly the text, and that means not only names and uh, and uh, dates and etc., but any information that could lead to an additive identification, uh, then we still uh, have the, the same problems we were referring to earlier. Right. And there's a question on, on liability, um, also from Francesca. Can a freelance translator acting as subprocessor, working for a translation agency, the processor, be charged with violation of GDPR if such translator was provided with pre-translated text for post-editing 
um, by such agency in violation of the GDPR. I mean, if the translation agency did not obtain consent for the reuse of the text by the original customer or controller. If, if I understand the question correctly, and it's quite complex, to be honest, uh, I think obtaining the, um, the, the consent, if you will, or defining the proper legal basis to be more broad is the responsibility of the controller. And I think in this scenario, uh, the agency is the controller. Uh, because it's the agency who decides that the, the document will be reused for uh, translation purposes. Um, but once again, I'm not 100% sure I understood. Yeah, it's that. a very specific, I think it's a very specific scenario where machine translation output is used without the client's consent. So I think this question is actually about can you feed your machine translation engines with data, at, which is is then later on reused to um, produce Which machine translation output. And that's the same question as with, with translation memories um, that's repurposing for machine translation, for the training of machine translation engines. And that's the same answer than for translation memories, that it is a new purpose, i.e. a new, new um, you become a controller for that data. The, the LSP becomes the controller. Mm, yeah, 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 Not sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is uh, yeah. Is, uh, the, the the processors uh, can be directly liable for some aspects of the GDPR uh, compliance. That's the new thing in in the GDPR, actually. But they're mostly liable for technicalities, really, like. Uh, for security, not uh, handling data breaches in an appropriate manner, um, but not for defining the legal basis, for example. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. The responsibility of the controller. <clears throat> okay. All right, I think we're going to um, stop here. We had a couple of more questions. So if you're desperate to have our experts answer them, then please join us on the, um, on, on the breakout rooms. But I'll hand the floor now over to uh, John for a summary and closing remarks. Um, and in the meantime, I'll share with you the breakout room link through the chat. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the experts today for all your input and all your insights in relation to GDPR and the translation and interpreting sector. And also thank you to all the members of the audience who have been with us all during the day and listening and uh, giving us their valuable uh, comments and their questions, which would be taken into account. And as Raisa says, if anyone has any questions that they think that they really need an answer to, please come over to the, the breakout rooms. So this meeting will, this webinar will end now in a couple of minutes, then we will re-enter uh, a, a Zoom meeting where we'll create three breakout rooms there for specific areas. So if I had to, to basically summarize uh, today's events, I think it would be, that we cannot be passive uh, in relation to GDPR. We need to be proactive. We need to be go out and actually learn more about GDPR and to be more aware and to actually uh, fight for the situation where we know what we're doing and we can identify in relation to the other actors in the translation chain that maybe they're not doing something correct and then uh if i can use the phrase pull them up about it uh tell them you know that this is the way it should actually be and that has many many different aspects we saw some aspects for example that someone is asking you to process data in a way that would contravene the gdpr or that uh, they don't want to sign a dpa uh, data protection agreement where in fact there should be a data protection agreement assigned. So if we're able to, through this entire process of having these working groups and working towards guidelines and producing the, the report and then potentially down the line, producing the, the code of conduct, the code of good practice, if we can get the translators all around Europe uh, more aware of what's going on, uh, this will definitely help uh, with the implementation of the GDR and also safeguard us because this is, again, as I said, right at the very beginning, 
one of the key aims of this objective is to give you the tools uh, so that you can uh, safeguard yourself so that you are not exposed to the potential risks of fines or sanctions or any sort of problems, uh, contractual liability, having to pay in those sort of circumstances. And uh, another thing that I would say is um, also what Mr. Vivorovsky uh, said this morning about the, the idea of, of guidelines, that guidelines are essential. It's something that we uh, realized very, very, very early on in this process. Uh, and it's very, very heartening for us as the experts on our side to hear that the, the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, have recognized you know, that, that what we're doing is the right way to go about this. And I think it gives all of us on the expert uh, working group uh, courage to, to continue our efforts to try and get uh, a set of proper, uh, well thought out, well reasoned, guidelines so that all of you can use them. Um, I think that's basically all I would like to say on the topic. I don't know if Raisa wants to, to add anything else. Um, no, I just part. wanted to say, I just wanted to say that we had over 700 people um, sign up for this webinar. Some of you have been here with us live, some are watching the recording or selected pieces later, some are watching the live stream um, over on Facebook. It's clearly a topic that you know, regardless of, of how onerous it is to comply, how difficult it is, how many gray areas we still have that we're trying to figure out. It's clearly something that we feel really passionate about and that we feel ownership on, that we want to do the right thing. And that is a fantastic place to be. And we've heard so many times over today as well that our industry is, is one of the trailblazers in determining how to implement, apply GDPR, how to comply with GDPR on a complex uh, supply chain with very specific um, challenges. And we want to continue on the work to, um, to figure out what are the practical guidelines um, that will be accepted by local data protection authorities that we've already seen today can have very um, different, different interpretations themselves as well. So we want to continue this work and, and, and invite you all to be part of that. And with that, we'll bring this webinar to an end and stop the recording. And hopefully we'll see all of you over in the meeting and where I will immediately, once we go in, I'll immediately then create the, the breakout room. So we'll have one breakout room for data retention, one for anonymization and one for risk mitigation. And the various experts will then spread themselves out among those three different rooms for people to, to ask any specific questions that they have. So again, thank you all for your attendance and see you in the breakout rooms.